Jump out gang, out gang, jump out gang. Hát te bújj! Hát te bújj, Tomari! Skominada! Skominada, Tomari! Kibeszeltek én a tegyén! It seems that the heavyweight title of Ring of Honor is now in control of the prophecy. Xavier deceived everybody in Ring of Honor, from the wrestlers to the announcers to the fans and Chris Daniels. I told you all along, the prophecy is true. The code of honor is a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke, it's a joke. We are here at the official Grappling Podcast. Me, I'm Connor. You are Eva. Mm, yeah, I guess. Yeah, and we are here now for this first episode. You will have seen the video teaser, but Eva, please spell it to the listeners what is the concept for this first episode this first journey into the grappling for us again so you know the um professional wrestler steven seagal certainly it's some of his best matches it's a match <laughs> compilation for steven seagal <laughs> you know like uh, we we watched a couple of his uh, his matches and you know we'll we'll be like uh, talking to each other about that sort of like a report of uh, m- m- matches and um, then after that we're going to be covering Code of Honor which as you know was when Ring of Honor after quite a while of uh, trying to trying to find its identity again uh, really reached a peak under the guidance of Seagal right? Agreed, agreed Absolutely, absolutely. It was a very respectful affair, filled with <laughs> explosions and zip lining, <laughs> and really cool green screens in helicopters. Oh, <laughs> those green screens are fucked up. Oh, I forgot about those, man. Oh shit. <laughs> but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um... Uh, who, who should who should start first with the, the report of uh, Seagal matches? Well, I watched probably his most uh, well-known work, Under Siege. Mm. Uh, my only prior experience with a Seagal film was 2005's Submerged. And I have a review on Letterboxd, which I'll read out verbatim. One seriously underutilized submarine, plus Steven Seagal convincing himself he is a black man approximately every half hour, <laughs> plus British soap actors pretending to be American, plus Vinnie Jones punching the fuck out of some geezer, equals a movie I watched on the television tonight. <laughs> the kind of movie when when the end credits come up, you got to point to the screen and look at the person next to you and say, movie. <laughs> which I, uh, I I can confirm that I did that <laughs> wonderful um... so yeah when I say he was convincing himself he is a black man he's like get your white ass out of here Vinnie Jones <laughs> stuff like that so that's cool yeah yeah that's pretty cool uh, what did you think of uh, Under Siege then? Under Siege was a better movie than Submerged. You heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. I uh, downloaded it on Soulseek from a user called Chlorine Bacon Skin. 
which um, <laughs> is an interesting visual. So it starts with Segal chopping the fuck out of some carrots. Like he's just going to town on these carrots. And then I realized he's called Ryback. Yes. So he's like, feed me more carrots. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So his uh, his attire of choice for his job where he works is um, obviously the chef whites, but yep. no shirt. He opted for you know the whole the whole shirtless chef whites look, which is good. <laughs> uh, and then early on he sort of just like effortlessly whoops five soldiers, and then he just gives up. He's like, all right, arrest me, fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, so I kind of thought, like, he could have just kept whooping ass, but, you true, know. True, truly, his, his most fearsome enemy is his own stamina. <laughs> yeah. You know, he he's very explosive. He, he's like Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, as we know, the Ryback so... and Goldberg comparisons have always been quite strong. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So well, that's when I uh, first saw Colm Meany, and I, I'd just like to point out that he's a really great this type of movie guy. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would even say underutilized in this one, because he, he, he's awesome. He's got a great evil face. Yeah, yeah. The evil guys, uh, they're, you know, they're the kind of guys that eat meat with their bare hands. We've all met them. <laughs> right. Uh, I see, I see, like, I'm trying to think, because I've not seen the full bit, full Under Siege movie. I'm trying to think of, like, uh, the the meat eating. I can't remember offhand, but I've not seen the full movie. Why? why did, is, is it just yeah, an establishing like, shot it, of, like, them eating, like, was it, like, raw meat? Or? Yeah, it was... Yeah, it was very brief. It, it wasn't like, and now it is time for us to eat meat with our bare hands. <laughs> yeah. It was like, no, they were just casually doing it. Like, you know, it could have been a cigarette or a glass of brandy. Like, <laughs> it's just like this background thing that they're doing. And it didn't even look cooked. I mean, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't know shit, but. Right. Maybe it was sashimi, brother. <laughs> So there's this naive young soldier guy who's, like, keeping guard of him while he's locked in the freezer, I think it is. Yes, yes. And uh, that, you know, it feels like that guy's building up a bit of a story arc, like, you know, oh, what, you know, what's his deal? <laughs> he he dies. He gets shot. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Seagal, you know, he, he's all powerful, but he, you know, there's only so much he can do. But the, but then Titty Lady is introduced. <laughs> I did not, I did not note down her name, but Titty Lady. Uh, she, she is injected into this film to remind you that women are stupid. Oh. What? What, 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 is she a ditzy, airheaded lady? She's just reckless. She doesn't know how to handle this situation. I see. I see. Yeah, it's a, it's a real shame. <laughs> it's, a re it's a real shame this movie had to have a woman in it. Because they, they just don't know what they're doing. So I got a note here. I think this is from the, the baddies. They go, this toad Swyback or whatever it is. Oh. Swyback. Swyback. <laughs> Swyback swoops. <laughs> uh, my next note is Ryback, extremely inscrutable backstory, but I have no memory of that and can offer nothing else. It's just, it's, it's inscrutable. 
the, the, the there's there's a there's a backstory that I that I uh, experienced that I actually have a clip of um uh, that like a several like you know why the fuck is in this movie there's nothing on the story or just like that so yeah I imagine it was of a similar level to that. Um, speaking of the baddies, what did you think of Gary Busey and Tommy Lee Jones in this? Oh yeah, they they're cool. They're cool. Uh, it it is a great cast of bad guys. It's almost like it's almost too good for the screen time that they get. It's, mo- it's mostly about Stephen and his antics. But yeah, I I, uh, I do have a note that says it's actually about the bromance between Tommy Lee Jones and Gary Busey because he's like. Gonna drown my crew, lol. <laughs> That's awesome, you beast. <laughs> like they're just really they're just like bragging about how evil they are and just like being like, oh man, that rules. <laughs> yeah, I remember the uh the actual siege moment comes as like this big master plan where uh Tommy Lee Jones is dressed up as like a, as a rock and roller. And Gary Busey is like for some reason dressed up in drag, um, and like yeah. you know like Gary Busey dressed up in drag. Like I think he sh- he shoots a guy. I can't remember if it's the captain or something like that. And then Tommy Lee Jones, he's like he's like doing crap participation. Like oh, what infantry are you from, sir? <laughs> blam blam, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I have actually got a bit on uh, Ryback's backstory. Oh, just a, wonderful! It's just the basic thing of like, oh yeah, you you know this guy who's a cook, he cooks on on the ship, right? Yeah. Well, he used to be a fully fledged navy recruit, but he was too good and dangerous, so he just had to cook pies instead. Oh right, okay, yeah, yeah. You, you know when you're too you're too good <laughs> at the navy, <laughs> so you get demoted to cook. <laughs> Yeah, the kitchen is the containment zone. <laughs> <laughs> does it does it all end well for Casey right back then? I think, I think it does. Uh, the the tasty lady does get redeemed somewhat by um, killing. You know, obviously, if you're a woman, that's something that you can do to redeem yourself. Is is uh, kill? Absolutely. There's a really beast kill by uh, Seagal. Where he just rips the dude's throat out. You seen that bit? No. Wow. Ah, oh, yeah. I would. I would say get on that. There's a classic bit towards the end, where the villain, he's got a gun pointed at you, right? And they're right. just having a full blown conversation. So, go ahead, pull the trigger. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> well, do it then. <laughs> Uh, maybe I will. <laughs> so that's like a really classic instance of that uh, trope, which uh, I I feel like I don't see that often, but it's it's very. <laughs> yeah, it's not so much in movies anymore. It said that tribal chief matches. Oh, <laughs> Grappley. <laughs> Yeah. So movies. for some reason, even though Sagawa was at gunpoint, it turns into like an arm flailing knife fight. Yes. Yes. And yes. Uh, this is this is perhaps the the most beast kill in this film, where Sagawa gouges his eyes and oh. then shanks him in the top of the head. Oh Sp- man. Sp- uh, what what are the practical effects like? Is is this like like bleh, his eyes are destroyed or? Oh yeah, he he, he fucked them up. He, he pushed them back into his brain. Jesus. So yeah, of course, uh, Sagal saves the day. He snogs the titty lady. Everybody oh. is laughing and clapping. P- <laughs> PTSD does not exist in this universe. <laughs> it's just like, wow, that was a close one, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then a, a serious, like, proper American salute is the final frame that it leaves you on, mm, mm. which I, f- I thought was very poignant because I I've been to the United States of America, <laughs> and I, I I am fully a part of their culture now. 
if anybody from the immigration board is listening to this, I hell yeah, America man. You you you've seen what the military, the United States Navy, you see what they protect, the freedoms that they uphold with their service. And you're on board. Yes, absolutely. They're stopping all the Gary Busey's from fucking <laughs> shit up. And I love that. A wonderful story, that is. So I'd, I'd go three and a five on that one. Really good. I'd recommend it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I understand this is not the limit of your right about consumption. Oh, yeah, of course, because, uh, I, you know, he's called Ryback for time to watch four Ryback <laughs> versus Kalisto matches. So His further adventures. One, of course, of course, you know, it's about 25 years later, he signs for the WWE, <laughs> and he has this really good series with Kalisto that we all love. So the first one was on uh, 2015 SmackDown. Which is a. Tw- I've watched a couple of 2015 SmackDowns. Very mm-hmm. interesting time for SmackDown. Obviously, before the before the uh, second main brand split, where they actually tried for a bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But Sm- before that, it was just kind of this void where nothing like important happened. It's very interesting. Yeah, SmackDown was almost like a. It, it was like a seesaw, except like. Maybe the people from the ASO would be there. Like, maybe Triple H would show up. But, like, man, I'm trying to think, like, how, how much was, like, say, like, the main of entity would be on SmackDown, really? I feel like it would be kind of, like, the same kind of guys. Like, I mean, in 2015, probably Cena is doing everything on Raw. But yeah. Rain Reigns will be there. He's on the up. You know, Reigns will be having matches like normal. It's only, like... So only like Cena, Lesnar, you know, those sorts of guys that won't even make an appearance there. But everyone else will be there just kind of doing, just deciding to do much less purposeful stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always remember that. I think, I think I'm, I may have mentioned this to you, but I always remember like, even when there was stuff of not on SmackDown, they would just end up redoing it on Raw. Cause I remember, like, yeah, exactly. The so like the shields, uh, the shield would have like their like their first defeat on like a SmackDown, and then oh, they'll just do a big moment on Raw like that to invalidate SmackDown, and then fucking like Rusev would suffer his like second loss ever against like I don't know like Cesaro, and then I would just run that on Raw. So like, Ugh. fuck you, SmackDown. <laughs> <laughs> you a dumb bitch, SmackDown. <laughs> not now obviously obviously Smackdown is now the the home of the bloodline the most epic shit ever but yeah Smackdown is the last back then, of Smackdown TV was deals. bitch so uh, I think there's a little pre-taped promo for this one where Ryback says he respects Kalisto's culture and his people which is which is nice when you face someone of uh, Hispanic heritage it's always nice to point that out yeah, yeah. I remember, like, uh, th- does Ryback ever go explicitly heel here? I remember there was, like, a lot of talk of him being a tweener, um, but, like, I, I don't know if there is... Like, I, th- I think it might have just been that whole... Th- the thing for the whole feud is that, like, he is... He and Kalisto just have a rivalry. Well, see, I've got an all-caps note for this match, is that the Code of Honor was adhered to for oh. this one. Oh, wonderful. Just hopefully he'll do it for all four well maybe not <laughs> so Kal- Kalisto wins this one um, I do I do I do love how video game friendly both of their entrances are just like you know right back's guy's thing yeah he sort of pumps himself up at the stage Kalisto's got the thing where he does the big leap over the ropes it's good yeah, like it, it's a very exact ritual followed robotically. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, Kalisto wins this one, and uh, Ryback seems fine with that. Like good, 
good one, little man. I, I respect your culture and the fact that you're better than me. That's what it's all about. So these, the second match between these two was on the pre-show of WrestleMania 32. Yes. What a great WrestleMania that was. So uh, <laughs> Ryback has sort of descended into the state of like saying, you know, the way he'd say, wake up, it's feeding time. Of course, yeah. Well, now he's sort of just kind of like, wake up, it's feeding time. Yeah, yeah, um, like, like, like he's done. <laughs> I'm sure you'll have to see your notes later on, but like, I do remember, uh, you know, he'd end up like, uh, his weight belt would end up having like uh, the pre-show stopper because you know, oh, he he, that's that's the thing that I thought about with Ryback a lot is that I remember when he like, when he turned heel and then just like did a free fall down the card and he was teaming with Curtis Axel. I remember he would be on Twitter and I thought he was like the wittiest dude ever because he would just make <laughs> such smarky references. And I remember there was this one Raw where he and Axel were on commentary and he sounded so fucking like charismatic, just like smooth and all that. And then like, it's weird. Like he, uh, he did the face turn, which would eventually lead to this moment in history. And it's like all that disappeared. Like, he was very awkward on the mix of it. I don't get it. <laughs> Faces, they're idiots. Mm. They're to the dark side. You could be intelligent. No inside of references. <laughs> yes. How, how did WrestleMania pre-show go then for right back at Kalisto? So, I always, I always remembered this one as, like, I thought this was the... Ryback versus Kalista on that, but I don't, right. I, I don't think it was. It, it was, it was decent. Mm. Obviously, mm. Uh, they're in that state where the, the crowd is still like filing in. It must be kind of weird to wrestle in that scenario. My main note here is that Jerry Lawler says he was in Kalisto's dressing room earlier for some reason, <laughs> and that Kalista was applying chapstick and deodorant. <laughs> what a weirdo lip. Yeah you moist lip Fucking nice melon bitch <laughs> What the fuck Why don't you have body odor Ah That's my Jerry Lawler <laughs> impersonation <laughs> oh, oh god <laughs> So yeah we, we go to another match On a 2016 Smackdown and th this was a very short little thing. Um, and my only real note is that Ryback doesn't even say it's feeding time now. He's he, he's full, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, that's if, if, I, if I had been like following along at the time, I definitely would have found that incredibly distressing. I'd have like, noticed that immediately and be like, fuck, he's got to leave because he's not doing the ritual like in the video game anymore. Oh. So then I got, then I got to the one that is definitely the Ryback and Kalisto match, and, and in fact, it's Ryback's last WWE match. Oh, good boy! <laughs> so they are in Illinois, so that's basically CM Punk territory. Oh yes. So we have big Goldberg chance. Big you can't wrestle chance and all that. Yeah, yeah. And then about two minutes later, right back just casually saves Kalisto's life. <laughs> <laughs> Kalisto just under rotates on this dive. He's about to land directly on his head. Kalisto saves that shit. The fucking base god. Right back is no longer dumb as fuck. Yeah, exactly. And then. Uh, there's a camp WWE advert midway through this match for some reason. Oh, Ric I... Flair is humping a boulder. <laughs> He's is, just... is, is this like I a wee graphic? I, love that I don't adult know. Entertainment. Is this like a graphic on the lower third, or does this just like interrupt the match fully? Oh yeah, it's, it in interrupts the match fully. Fuck. Like, yeah, you don't you don't need to see this bit. Camp WWE is coming up. 
and I think it was the first episode. And yeah, I just lo- I just love the adult orientated humor of it. Cause like Ric Flair, he likes sex a lot, so he'll hump this boulder <laughs> and get off by doing that. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Woo. That's really charming, and uh, you know, <laughs> as you say, that is well. <laughs> but yeah, the, this is if you are gonna watch Ryback this is Kalisto match today. You should watch this one. It's great. The payback uh, 2016 pre-show. That'll be. Yeah, payback 2016 pre-show. Watch it. The All State Arena in Rosemont, Illinois. Oh hell yeah! And that's all. That's all my under siege based notes. Very nice. Well, my first one, Eva, is uh, I watched Hard to Kill. Uh, as you can, uh, this was when uh, oh. Seagal was in Impact Wrestling. <laughs> 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 yes, the 1990 movie. 1990 movie, Hard to Kill. Uh, one of Seagal's, um, I believe it's his second movie, and it was definitely one of the uh, big uh, sort of like impacts of him as like being a movie star and all that. Um, effectively the story is uh, one of revenge because uh, Steven Seagal is one Mason Storm who is a cop and he begins the movie at the docks he's eavesdropping he's got his directional microphone you know and uh, he he is he's like uh, looking at the mob who are making deals and they're making deals with who else but William Sadler who's playing a senator, Senator Trent. And um, so he's, uh, he's like, listen to his microphone, but oops, he, he like drops something, makes a noise. And uh, the, the, the goons who are there are like, let me go check it out. And then, you know, <laughs> the Seagal dispatches him and has to run away. And, you know, all seems well. So now uh, Seagal can, you know, go to his uh, attend to his home life. He goes to get some champagne and a tip for his wife and a teddy bear for his son. Um, he goes oh. to a shop for this, and uh, this is the first sort of instance that I saw in this movie of sort of like uh, I'm sure like came across in Under Siege too, where Seagal he's he's not content to just be a sort of a Chuck Norris type or a Jean-Claude Van Damme type where, you know, they, they're they not all that in the charisma department, but, you know, they're really fun to watch. They're like action movie stars, you know. He wants to be charming. So he has a lot of ample opportunities for banter, for repartee. And the first instance of this is, uh, you know, when he, he, go, he goes to the shopkeep and he's like, uh, well, you got the champagne. And the shopkeeper goes, oh, right next to the caviar. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, like, uh, there, there's this, like, strange, like, conversation to have where, like, I guess the Oscars were supposed to be on. Like, uh, fucking Seagal's like, why, why, why are you watching the Oscars? And the shopkeeper's like, the Oscars. Who needs the fucking movies? I got, I got horror, art, right fucking here. And he's pointing to, like, the cameras of his shop. So, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, uh, this this budding friendship is cut short because a bunch of thugs come in and they hold up the mm. shopkeeper, and then just like blast his shit, uh, like, I I I guess like there's some sort of thing where like this has happened before with the shopkeep because they they also have like a whole thing, and like the thug shoots him, uh, he shoots him in the chest, and then the shopkeep goes down and he goes. Now you only got half a mind. So that, that was pretty good. And then, um, you know, uh, there actually is a pull the trigger sort of moment here because oh. the the thug shoots the shopkeep with a shotgun, double barrel shotgun, and then Seagal walks up and rests his chin on the barrel of the shotgun. And then he goes, come on, pull the trigger. Come on, you all got one shot left. And then he like flicks the gun away. It shoots. Oh no, he's out of ammo. And then he starts beating the shit out of these thugs. Um, 
and then there's a whole thing of like there's a there's one last guy who's very short and he's like got a knife and they have a standoff where Seagal is like you know the the, the thug he's all like tense he's like waiting for Seagal to come near him and Seagal's like oh what's the problem he's holding the shotgun you, is it because mine is bigger than yours I'll put it away how about that in fact let me get down my knees let me, let's make this fair huh come on get some you know just he like all he loves that shit he fucking loves it he gets so like, into it. Let's, let's put the guns away, pal. The guns are an inferior form of combat. We must settle right. this purely. Um, and, you know, I okay, I think I realize now why there's the Oscars chatter, because it makes this, I guess, make sense. There's a really hard cut where Seagal takes the knife guy down. He breaks his ankle, just like snaps it absolutely gruesomely. And then, as the guy's screaming in pain, hard cuts to Seagal outside, shaking a, ha- a cop's hand, who says, looks like you win the Oscars tonight, Storm. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so it's just the guy screaming in pain, and it's just like, oh, it's all over, and it's great. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, that's um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, so now it's Seagal, after having done that, like he's got his champagne and teddy bear. I guess he got them for free. The transaction didn't really take place, I don't think. So, you know, <laughs> good for Seagal. You got, you got some money off oh, that. He, he earned it. <laughs> uh, so he comes home to his loving wife uh, and, like, uh, his son, who the wife is like, oh, it took me so much to get him to sleep, but now he's sleeping and turns out, oh, no, he's still awake. And Seagal in this movie, a God-fearing man, very much... Uh, uh, prioritizes one's prayers and he 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 gets his son up and they they take they do their prayers you know like they pray and their soul the lord to take and whatnot and now it's time for him to have him and his wife to have sex with each other um you know they 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 were like are drinking champagne together and you know like kissing and all that all the while jimmy carson's on um i'm not entirely sure why then it turns out oh the goons are here. <laughs> they followed him after discovering him at the docks. And there's also like uh, Mason Storm has like some partner who uh, w- 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 who was like radioing into him. They get him too. Like he's also watching Jimmy Carson and they're just like, ah, blam, blam, you're dead. Um, and then they, they, they break into Mason Storm's house and it's while uh, Mason and wife are making love. They burst in, and like, you know, this is the first instance of like Seagal's absolute strength because they they come in, they blast him in like the chest, and you know what his reaction is? He gets up and goes, "You motherfucker!" Like, you know, this is a <laughs> this is an annoyance to him, um, and then you know they 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 shoot his wife. His wife is blasted, absolutely dead, and, you know, yeah. eventually, after a couple more shotgun blasts, Seagal is down. It goes to, um, it goes to the hospital, where, you know, I, I can't remember what the exact thing is. He, yeah, Frederick Coffin plays the lieutenant, Lieutenant O'Malley, who is the senior of uh, Mason Storm. He is told that, uh, you know, oh, Unfortunately, Mason Storm died. R.I.P. to him. And, you know, one of the other cops, who turned out to be crooked, is like, nuts to him. He sucked. And Frederick Coffin, in that very <laughs> recognizable voice, is, listen to me, you little punk. Mason Storm is the best cop I've ever seen. Shut the fuck up, my mother. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, O'Malley's taken aside, and it's revealed to him, well, actually, we made a mistake. He's in a coma. And he's like, okay we cannot let his enemies know that he is actually alive. Let's just say he's dead. And then it cuts to seven years later. He's been in a coma all this time and is now a skinny boy. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he wakes up and as soon as that happens, they're after him again. O'Malley was very correct to do this decision, but it's like the least worst case thing because fucking, oh my God, they immediately know he's alive and try to come after him. There's a, there's, there's quite a nice scene where, um, you know, this is a part where uh, 
the I wouldn't describe her as a titty lady, but like, you know, the love interest for Seagal is a nurse. The nurse that wakes him up at the coma thing. And, you know, there's this, this nice little scene where Seagal is uh, too weak to actually do any action. So he just like uses a broom to push his like bed out. <laughs> <laughs> He, like, gets himself into the elevator with it and shit. And, like, uh, there's a funny bit where, you know, um, it, it, I think it's the closest to sort of, like, action where Seagal, like, looks a bit silly on purpose, where, you know, like, she's, like, wheeling him out of the hospital. He's, like, bumping into shit and stuff. <laughs> it's real good. Um, but, yeah, they get out of there. And then it's time for... It's time for Seagal to begin healing. It's time for him to bulk up again. And I'm going to play for you now. Um, this is a monologue that he does while he's uh, living with the nurse. This is because uh, he is uh, he tells her to go to Chinatown because he knows the Chinese medicine he needs to bulk back up again. And she asks, how do you write so good in the Chinese? And this is what Seagal says. Where did you learn to write in Chinese? Well, when I was a kid, my father was a missionary, so he raised in the Orient. And there's a young white boy over there, I needed to learn how to fight, as you can imagine. <laughs> I remember, I went to my first martial arts teacher, and he says, so why do you come to me? And I say, I say, uh, to learn how to fight. And he says, oh, so you want to hurt people? But do you want to be great? I say, yeah. I want to be great. He says, then first learn how to heal people to be great. To hurt people is easy. So, like, the whole time... The nurse is looking at him like she's like giving him like the bedroom man. She's like, "Holy shit, he's so hot!" While he's <laughs> fucking rambling, this is utter rambling here. Like, <laughs> literally, he he. I was thinking about it yesterday. He reminds me of Gabe Sapolsky really, because like he he has this like idea, this, this absolute exact idea of what he wants to say, but he just like it, it just spills out of him in such a graceless way. Like, you know, just fucking be like, oh, my, my teacher said, oh, do you want to hurt people? I said, I want to hurt people. Like, it's just so, like, it comes out <laughs> so goofy. He's such a goofball. Um, but, you know, he gets his Chinese medicine. You get you, you get a lot of shots of him, like, acupuncturing himself and, like, lighting incense and all that shit. Um, and then in the course of this, he uh he discovers that it was Senator Trent William Sadler who is the bad guy who is like you know uh, sicked the goons on him and his family, and this is a uh, you know this is probably the the most famous thing in the movie that I'm going to play here. But basically, uh, the way that, that there's a fatal flaw that William Sadler in this movie has, he has his catchphrase. You can take that to the bank. He uses that both in his political speeches and when he's doing crime. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see this now. This is uh this is uh like the like sort of like the sequence where Seagal's just like he's, he's in his head. It's like all these loops of uh, all these thoughts are looping, and eventually he catches onto it. Well, the blood bank. <laughs> I really noticed uh, clipping this out that, like, well, well, the do 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 is playing. He's just kind of like sitting there looking around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from there, uh, it really becomes a, sort of a, a revenge movie. Um, 
this is the first respect in which I would say, because there's another example in uh, the other movie I watched where this also applies. This is the first aspect of which I feel like Steven Seagal is inspired by the Count of Monte Cristo. Have you ever have you ever read that book, Eva? I have not. Well, in this in this respect, uh, so like you know, Count of Monte Cristo, one of the premier like revenge stories, where you know a guy gets fucked up, he go he comes into money and enacts like a big twenty year plan of revenge, and here, um, in the latter half of the movie, Seagal is just tracking down these dudes, or like you know, it. It's sort of weird because like they're trying to catch him, but but he's also just trying to exact revenge as well. Is 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 like it goes back and forth like that. But you know, by the final scene where he shows up to, uh, Senator Trent's big McMansion, and he's just picking dudes off. You know, um, like he he really becomes sort of like a, it's it's like a phantom. He like stalks his enemies, the like cower in his presence, and he just like exacts vengeance upon them but you know his his charisma does not really lend itself well to that because he can't help himself from just like fucking like you know doing the thing again of like yeah uh, you know he walks in on uh he walks in on a bunch of the goods playing uh, like pool and he just goes like what's the action boys can i play and it's just <laughs> like man come on um but yeah, then like there's a whole like thread throughout the story where when it becomes clear that Mason Storm is alive again, they try to slander him in the media. But Mason Storm knows a knows a prominent news man, so he sends him the evidence. <laughs> and at the end he he gets Senator Trent and is about to kill him when here's the police and Senator is like, Oh officers, arrest this man and the officer's like no you and takes it away because like oh the evidence came through Mason you're cleared and this whole time his son's been alive and O'Malley's been taking care of him O'Malley like uh, goes down he gets murked um, which is quite sad but he has a good performance in it um, and yeah so now there is the nurse and Seagal and son they are a happy uh, trio of family members together Um so yeah yeah so i guess the moral is if your wife gets murked marry a nurse <laughs> yeah it's, it's quite it's <laughs> quite something um but no uh no i i believe you have uh some uh sniping to do eva so the second steven seagal movie i watched for this was called Sniper Special Ops, and this was from 2016, I believe, and it was directed by Fred Olin Ray, who is known in the wrestling sphere, I say known, he he, he has wrestled as Fred Valentine. Yes, so yes. So I'll be briefly talking about a selection of his matches later, but I will save that. I downloaded this one from a SoulSeek user called uh, 231234. So, uh, cool, cool usernames all around for this little project. I think the first thing I really noted down is that Seagal, Seagal talks <laughs> like he's glued his tongue to his teeth. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> like, oh, no. like, this is a good... This is a good uh, 25 or so years after Under Siege. They, they talk like this now. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> wow, that's pretty drastic. <laughs> so I logged the time in the movie that Seagal gets up off his fucking ass and is not in a chair. Yes, yes. And it took uh, 13 minutes. <laughs> It's 13 truly... minutes, but but he was just standing in one spot on a balcony firing a machine gun. This truly is a motherfucker just sitting movie. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Fred, Fred Olleray, he he's 
a very interesting cult director. I have not seen anything else by him, but he has directed movies such as Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. Mm. Sounds promising. Evil Tunes, where four sexy young girls are to clean a, an old house for the new owners. They get delivered an old book full of magic incantations, and while reading it, they accidentally bring a cartoon character to life. The cartoon character likes the blood of young girls. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> so, so that's uh, so plenty of cool stuff like that. Yeah, he seemed like a really prolific director uh, when like, you first yeah. brought him up to me. Yeah, most of it's from like late 80s, I believe. But um, in 2016, he was doing this. <laughs> but, right, time, I've, d I've done all the sexy, weird horrors. Now it's time for a war movie with Seagal. <laughs> uh, an interesting change of pace. How much do you think a Seagal contract costs? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess it would, I guess it would be kind of expensive. Maybe that's why, like, the movies have like no investment in like special effects or anything like that. Oh, right, right. Yeah, like he takes up the majority <laughs> of the budget. Right. Yeah, we we spunked it all on Sagal sitting down. <laughs> paid all that money to have him sit down and when you could have just pointed the camera at him living normally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so uh, what, 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 what's the story of Sniper Special Ops then? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> war. <laughs> <laughs> war and guns and war, war. Am I right? And he be sniping? He be sniping. <laughs> Oh, he's got his little, he's got his little sniping chair. <laughs> oh, he's on it. <laughs> I like to imagine it's, it's not even like he's like traveling places then sitting in a sniping chair. He's just like at home. <laughs> the war comes to him. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like in his in his like little living room with a green screen. It's like yeah, make it look like the war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just <laughs> and if I've got, I'm pointing my remote here if you can make that look like a gun that would be great <laughs> oh my goodness that sounds like a, a wonderful movie as I told you when you first told me that this movie sucks <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I did know that uh, frightened civilians during gunfights be like like when you know when you're terrified, you're like, <laughs> you, you you did not come through there. You're too high best. <laughs> well, you know, it, all that matters is that you know ter terrified people look staring death in the face. They be like, <laughs> uh, so there's a commanding officer who's like a hundred years old. Uh, Seagal, he holds a gun like it's a, he holds a gun like it's a coat hanger he's using to dislodge something from behind the fridge. Oh my god. <laughs> he practically holds it with like his, his index finger and his thumb. Like it's, this, this guy has not been taught how to hold guns. That's odd. I, you, I feel like he usually like flexes how much gun knowledge he has. Or what you to think he has, but but deep down he he doesn't <laughs> like guns. But he, if it was up to him, the fucking war war in Afghanistan or wherever this is would be fought exclusively with knives. All oh, right, so maybe it's a source of tension between Seagal and Mister Valentine. He wants to be like, I want to. Uh... I keep to everyone while sitting dead, and he goes, "No, you put gun." It's I was like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll point the gun. <laughs> I just have a feeling I won't be doing it very well. Uh, oh my god! So uh, the the main female character in this one, one of her second lines is, 
I apologize for being pushy. I, I love it when uh, I apologize for being pushy. <laughs> Very formally, yeah. That's so yeah, and this one, Sagao is kind of not even the main character. I couldn't really tell you who was. It feels like he should be the main character, but was just kind of like too lazy to do more scenes. Right, yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like an even spread of like, just dudes. <laughs> and of course, one of those dudes is Rob Van Dam. He has a, uh, he has a single digit number of lines. Oh. And uh, that's all like, <laughs> you know, he's there. I can't really say much more about him, about his, about his performance, about his character. He's, he's there. Good, for, good for him. It's a race against a bit stay for special ops. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit more. Um, so there's a. There's a scene. There's a scene where Sagao's in a room with another troop, and this troop is like pouring with sweat, like gasping, and Sagao is like completely dry, clean, <laughs> fresh out of the shower. Basically, <laughs> he's just towed off. <laughs> and this other troop is like, "Oh man, it's crazy! It's crazy out there! It's crazy!" And Sagao's just like nodding. <laughs> he casually looks out the window at two corpses. Then he keeps nodding. <laughs> like he's. I, th I think if there is a plot to this movie, it's about a man who is completely unfazed by war. This is reminding me now of, uh, you know, when uh, they got Kiefer Sutherland to voice Big Boss in Metal Gear Solid Five. And like seemingly his rate was very high, so a lot of the game is just Big Boss like looking around somberly, <laughs> as opposed to speaking. <laughs> maybe maybe Seagal's uh, voice box had a separate contract. It was very high. <laughs> I believe so. If this was, if I was co to compare this movie to a much cooler wrestling match, it would be Super Crazy's appearance in Zona Twenty Three in uh, two thousand and twenty. Oh. Where he spends most of his time leaning on the apron, casually chatting to one of his opponents, while the skinny guys did all the high spots. That's... So if you're thinking of watching Sniper Special Ops, I, I recommend you just watch that instead. Personally. Yeah, yeah. Steve Seagal, a poor man, super crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, that's about all I've got on the movie. Just let me... Uh... Take a sip of water here. So then, my second movie was oh. Belly of the Beast, which is a 2003 movie, which I believe this sort of acts as a good in-between from Prime Seagal and modern Goatee Seagal. You know, Seagal in 2003 is clean-shaven, he's uh, bulked up a bit, <laughs> um, mm. and... Yes, I, I picked this movie because uh, I swear I have a DVD case of this around somewhere. I've always known of it as the Seagal movie that's in my house. Um, and I watched it and I did not regret it one bit. The story of Belly the Beast starts in Thailand. That's the main setting for this. And Seagal is with his partner, Sunti. And they are out and about um, I can't remember the exact thing that they're engaged in, but it was something where they're sitting down at a table and, um, you know, they're trying to negotiate stuff, but then it goes sour. And Seagal and Sunti, uh, they, they start shooting out and stuff. But tragedy strikes Eva because Sunti is, like, chasing the guy around and they trip over some water. And it goes splish splash everywhere. <laughs> and it's not just that you can take from this, like, oh, his vision is obscured because of water. It shows a shot of Sunti squinting and shaking his head, and it cuts to a POV shot of his vision. There is a waterfall going over his eyes, and you can hear a foley sound of a shower running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to make entirely sure that you know that, oh, he can't see, right? Because then he shoots. And his bullet hits a mother. A mother holding her baby. And the mother goes down. 
he wipes his eyes and is like, no, I killed a murderer. Oh! And from there, time lapses on. Sunti played by Byron Man, by the way. Um, and Seagal, his name is Jake Hopper. I learned this from looking at the cast again. I did not take any notes of this because I don't think at any point did he really... I mean, I'm sure they do, but it's really not a memorable thing. Again, Seagal is one of those actors, like, he's just Seagal, you know? The Whatever fucking character name is secondary to it. Um, but, yes, yeah, so now the reason why Seagal comes back to Thailand is because he has a daughter, and the daughter is in Thailand, and then she gets kidnapped! And it's like, oh no, father must, uh, you know, go rescue daughter. So he goes back to Thailand and he gets a taxi over and it's sort of like it's, it's sort of akin to you know the the limo scene in Die Hard where this guy's asking all these questions and trying to strike up conversation and Seagal is like why don't you just take me to where I need to go man and then unfortunately unlike the Die Hard scene the taxi man is not an important character he turns around with a gun that says the ride is over and then Seagal beats him <laughs> up and a bunch of the other guys. Um, and this uh, this is the second aspect of where uh, the Monte Cristo comparison comes in. And I think it speaks to a very crucial aspect of um, Seagal as how he likes to be imagined. Is that not a scream, but... It was, <laughs> <Sorry>. yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, if uh, you want to get a 99, I'll be what I get. <laughs> uh, um, so, so a big part of uh, Steven Seagal is that he is a citizen of the world and a native wherever he steps. He is in Thailand and you see him just so fluently follow not only the language but also the customs, you know. You you know he's hitting that motherfucking proper bow Thai style, <laughs> and like you know it's 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 not limited to Thailand because there's a clip I'm gonna play here, uh, where basically, uh, the story put to him by people he contacts is that he his daughter has been kidnapped by the Abu Karam terrorist <laughs> unit right, and like you know. All, all of these actors who are like are, you know, American stuff, they just say, oh, it was by the Abu Karam. But here is how Seagal would say it. This is him talking to an informant who tries to put him, who he tries to get in touch with. Please, sit down. Alaikum <laughs> Salam. What can I do for you? I was wondering if you could maybe pass on a message for me. Who to? The Abu Karab. Abu Karab. <laughs> He's getting that shit out. He's hitting that he's shit. So good at accents. <laughs> he, he's the, one, the one he keeps, the one he keeps returning to the most is probably like the Cajun accent, but he's he's probably a master at all of them. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like uh, again, he's just off the world, and it reminds me of Monte Cristo because. Uh, you know, there's a there's a great deal of scenes where um, uh, there was this one I was thinking of in the book where uh, it's at the point where one of the people that Monte Cristo is getting revenge against, you know, the Count has ingratiated himself into the social scene of France so as to get to closer to his enemies. And one such enemy has, like, been like, hold on, what's this guy's deal? I'm going to see about this. And he ends up talking to uh, this Lord Wilmore, an Englishman who walks in <laughs> and they make this big thing of like, oh, he he has such a full-throated flemmy ho! Oh, that, only an Englishman, a native Englishman could speak that way. And oh, how he bows. There's, there's no other way. It's clearly an Englishman who I should trust. And then the guy leaves and it's like, oh, then the Count of Monte Cristo took off his disguise. It was him all along. You know, like... <laughs> so just this whole thing of like he he's so able to wear other cultures and ethnicities you know it comes so naturally to him at least that's how that's how he wants you to perceive him um 
So that was pretty good. And it turns out that uh, Abu Karam is not behind this. It's actually some of the Thai soldiers. There's this uh, central uh, general character who, you know, uh, because like the US has an interest in following Seagal. They're like, oh, let's make sure this guy it, it doesn't go too crazy. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll need to make him a chef. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know they're they're communicating with the Thai military, and you know that the, this general guy. But it turns out you know he's actually the one who is holding the daughter hostage, and this is a larger thing than just military stuff, Eva. This is a battle of Satan versus good, because this this Thai general <laughs> is actually acting under the orders of like this fucked up satanic dude who just like sits in like uh he sits in his like meditation room and he just like meditates and like opens like a box full of worms and then does voodoo shit to them um it's a weird thing because i'm realizing now there's never like a shot where like well yeah okay there, there is a shot where like the the Thai general is like uh, oh hello master i will serve satan for you and like that's the one time you see with anyone else otherwise it's just a shot of him alone doing his meditation and going fucking freaking out because like satanic shit's happening um meanwhile fortunately this forces of good are here because see sunti after he killed that mother he renounced the badge he went to become a buddhist and atone for his sins so Seagal goes to the Buddhist temple where Sunti is. He's been there for the last seven years and, you know, Sunti is like, okay, I will help you find your daughter, Seagal. And the, the head honcho there, I cannot recall the term, but, you know, the main sort of like priest guy, uh, he's there and Seagal fucking like, you know, talks with him. Uh, and so basically like, well, we'll get too, too far ahead. Basically like... Uh, one of, the, one of the main guys uh, who tells him that it's Abu Karam is this guy, Fitch, who runs a club, a nightclub. And <laughs> he goes there and, you know, Fitch is like, oh, man, I heard it was the Abu Karam. Uh, maybe you should go check that out. And then while Seagal is there, he's, he, he saves a lady from being harassed because there's this dude who is like, Oh, that bitch paid for it, and now I ain't getting no pussy. And uh, Seagal is like, what's your problem, Junior? And he's like, I ain't no Junior. And then he beats him up. And then the lady becomes a love interest. And, and initially, Seagal, oh, hell yeah. Seagal is not interested because he has dead wife to think about. But then eventually, ah, they fuck. Is so, that a fetish of Seagal's at this point? Like... <laughs> Man, I wish my I wish my wife would die so I could get <laughs> off with someone else. Gosh, I don't think I've ever heard of dead wife fetish before, but Seagal, Seagal has it, I think. <laughs> I'm sure it exists. He he leans on it as a creative device, yes. Um there is this other group of um of militants, uh Thai militants who like they're making this money deal. And so Sunti and Seagal, they go to a train yard where this is happening. And there's this whole thing where there's someone who's going to shoot the main guy of this militant unit. And Seagal's like, I can't let that happen because then he he will not be able to tell me the crucial info as to where my daughter is. And it's very funny because like he has that whole like monologue of thought while he's looking at a guy aiming. <laughs> So I just imagine, like, my cut of this movie would be him just going, like, can't have that, no survey, and then you just hear a gunshot, <laughs> and then the movie ends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, fortunately, he shoots that guy who's going to shoot the other guy, and then this whole big train yard scene happens. I'd say the action in this movie is pretty good. There's, like, you, like, you know, there's, like, a whole bunch of, like, Seagal kicking ass that have, like, passed over. Um, and, you know, all of it's pretty, like, fun, um, and then he ends up meeting with, like, this, this militant guy who is wary of him, but then they, he realizes they have shared interests, 
and it's like, uh, uh, I'll tell you about your daughter and blah, blah, blah. And all the while, like, uh, let's see. Yes, the train yard scene ends with Seagal being arrested and the military police are all like, oh, Seagal, you better watch your step. I should kill you. But your American buddies here, the diplomat, so hey now, but I'm going to kill you next time I see you. And Seagal is like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's not taking them seriously. Um, <laughs> and then like that guy, that captain who was threatening him like that, he goes to the general who is currently training. Like he's a big ripped guy, like fucking training and stuff. And then he, the general hears like, oh, you had Seagal, but you let him go? Oh, okay. And like he gives him an apple and he, and the captain like takes it shaking and the guy goes, hold out the apple captain closer to your head. And he does the fucking William Tell thing where he like mm-hmm. shoots the apple off his head and it's like, next time it will be your head. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> I pretty... fucking hate the English. <laughs> Actually, this guy is a Thai guy. His, his, his accent is just fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's an interesting thing where there's a guy that they go to see at a warehouse. I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it's someone they encountered early in the story who they could then get information from. Sunti and Seagal, that is. So they go there to this warehouse and they see the guy tied up in a chair, dead. And they're like, damn. And then... Ninjas come out. <laughs> the ninjas pop in and they have this big long fight scene where they just like beat up the ninjas and take care of them and then they look at the chair with the with the dead person still there and they're like, damn. Like it very superfluous fight scene. It didn't add anything to like what the story progression was. They just had the ninja fights. Um So the girl's like, Oh, and also there was these ninjas and they were like <laughs> Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like li- literally, just like to do some cool stuff. And uh, speaking, yeah. speaking of uh, superfluous, um, they're driving around, and then this lady steps into the road, and so he's like, "Hey, what the hell?" And then, but Seagal is like, "Oh, I think this lady wants me to follow her," and she does want that. She takes him to this like, I think it's this like a cafe or something like that, like. She, you know, she's wearing, like, a full sort of, like, you know, like, dress and, like, uh, hood and all that. She takes it all off to reveal her boobs. And what she does, she, t- she takes a nearby sponge, ladders it with water, and sp- uh, strokes it across her boobs. And what happens? It reveals letters. It reveals <laughs> these letters of, like, some language. And the girl's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and then wait what reveals uh, letters on the boobs yeah yeah so like it's um like the suds no 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 like it's in her flesh <laughs> what it, 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 she has like glow in the dark skin except it's like glow in the water like hydrophobic skin uh, thing um and well, like, how she done that clever <laughs> <laughs> old girl uh, I, I, yeah, I can't even remember. Like, it really is. It really does feel like a gratuitous nudity thing that you like try to tie very tenuously to like whatever satanic shit is going on. Um, like, no, these tits are part of the plot. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> like, Sunti was ready to just like I don't know run over this lady, but the guy was like, no, wait, her tits may tell us something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so by this point, Fetch, you know, we figured it out. It's an evil mofo because uh, Seagal's love interest works for Fetch, obviously. And, you know, she is the one who tells him, like, hey, wait, he told you he don't know anything, but I know he knows something. And Seagal's like, huh, maybe you should do some espionage on his office. And, like, she fights a bunch of shit. So then, like, you know, there's a scene where uh, Sunti and Seagal show up to the club. It's empty, and Fitch is like, you know, he's like trying to make his getaway. He's, he's getting all his cash out of that safe, and you know, they run onto each other, 
and immediately Fitch is like pointing a gun at him and you know there's this whole thing where Seagal has like a whole fucking monologue where he like explains world affairs and you know there's a, there's a part where he goes like well after 9-11 well you know like you know he's just being a cool cat <laughs> with his social commentary and uh, then who appears but this uh, this character who would have been seen throughout the movie sort of as like a uh, I believe the first first part that that they show up is like during that clip that I that that, that I played where the the Arabic guy before Sigal sits down with him, this character gets up and walks by him and they have like a stare off, right? It's this weird thing where I'm not sure why why this is put in here again, a very superfluous choice. It's just like uh so you know, it's presented as like a woman who does the combat good and then like uh fucking like her like top comes off and it's like oh actually a guy and then Seagal quips I liked you better as a bitch and it's like whoa <laughs> so this character is of no consequence uh, no no trouble to Seagal dispatches him immediately basically um and then you know then it's fully figured out that the Thai army are the terrorists here. They kidnapped the daughter, and Cap and the general was helped by a satanic dude. Um, so they show the Seagal and uh, Sunti show up to the again the big big mansion where the Thai army lives, and they have this insane fucking shootout where there's just so much explosions and gunfire going on. It's it kind of reminds me of a. Uh, you ever seen A Better Tomorrow 2? No, I've seen the first one, I think. Yeah, no, I, I... Not two. Yeah, like, uh, I suppose A Better Tomorrow 1 has several levels of action. Just, like, fucking crazy. Just, like, so much of it. And so, like, <laughs> it comes to the point where... So they rescue the daughter from there. The daughter was there all along. So he does. And, like, he's kind of just on his own, like, fighting off this entire army of gunfire while Seagal alone gets the, gets the general there and, like, it starts fighting him. And there's a whole thing of like, you know, it's a spiritual battle. There, there's stuff at play that's bigger than just flesh and blood, you know. Like it cuts to the satanic guy. He's fucking going nuts, like uh, fucking sticking shit into straw dolls and all that. But meanwhile, the the Buddhism temple, they are just like doing praying and stuff. It's uh. Uh, have you ever watched Encounters of the Spooky Kind? No. I, I keep meaning to. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd really recommend it. So, so, like, the end of Belly's Beast is sort of like the end of Encounters of the Spooky Kind, except way less good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, yeah, so basically the, the, the good of the Buddhism prayer ends up triumphing over the evil of Satan. And then Seagal, you know, kills the general with, like, some, like, you know, he, like, fucking gets his fingers all together and, like, jabs his throat and, like, oh, my God, that reverberates for his whole body and kills him, maybe, I guess, yeah. And then, you know, uh, it's tragic, though, because they, uh, he meets up with his daughter and Sunti, Sunti, it's just, he's, he's, it's too late for him. He's, he's been shooted too much and dies <laughs> in his arms. And he's like, no. Uh, but thankfully, though, Sunti sacrificed himself to get daughter back. And now, uh, love and trust and Seagal and child are happy family member trio once again. Great stuff. Um, and that's Bell of the Yay. Beast. Hooray. Good for Stephen. He always figures it out by the end and has <laughs> sex. I, I realised I forgot to talk about Rob Van Dam and Freddy Valentine. So I watched two RVD matches and three from Freddy Valentine. Oh. Uh, I haven't got extensive notes on all of them. But um, my, my original plan with RVD was to watch a House of Hardcore show from 2016, which was the first match that he had after the release of Sniper Special Ops. But 
I could not find it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if House of Hardcore is archived. I couldn't even find somewhere to like pay for it. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know where the fuck that shit is. But it had RVD, the Chris Hero, uh, known in some circles as King James, and uh, it also featured Eddie Kingston versus Bull James, and that would have been <laughs> fun to watch as well. <laughs> Phil James also so I, known I, in circles as King James as well. To to be good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I couldn't find it, so I decided to make do with these two RVD matches. Uh, I think fairly close, like either side of the release date for Sniper Special Ops. Sure, sure. So the first one is RVD versus Scott Steiner from BTW slash Legends of Wrestling, aka Low. <laughs> And this is baseball field grappling. Oh, wonderful! Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so it's a good, it's a good little, good vibe for this. Uh, Steiner is accompanied by Luke Gallows for some reason. Yo. Just, just because it, it feels very um, GFW core, you know. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a commentary team of Matt Stryker and Tyrus, but we cannot hear them. <laughs> It's not a. It's <laughs> like a very good creative decision here. I don't know. It, it's it's not a fan cam because it's moving around ringside. Yeah. But it's not like produced with cuts and commentary. It's just following one cameraman's feed. So Matt Striker and so, Tyrus are are in this shot. You just can't hear them. Yeah, I, I can see them. Can't hear them. I'm fine uh, with that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, it's a it's a strange it's a strange experience because RVD's kind of promo and the camera is close enough that you can hear the words like directly from his mouth but it's muffled by like the echo of the microphone going up into the open air and he he brings out Bret Hart for some reason which is nice wow and this match once they start wrestling features a clip that I've actually seen before uh, the crowd, or some members of the crowd, start chanting, We want Hogan. And Steiner retorts with, Piece of shit ain't coming! I, I, I assume the fans' response was, oh, Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the fans found that funny. Yeah, definitely seen that clip somewhere. So, probably like, Shortly after it happened. Mm. So I was like, oh yeah, that piece of shit ain't coming. Nice. <laughs> uh, the the grapple is pretty fun. It's carried by Steiner's shit talking. In mm. fact, I'd say Scott Steiner is the perfect Steiner. What? But Eva, that, that runs in contrast to the current uh, sensibilities <laughs> where it is said that Braun Breaker of NXT who is Rick Steiner's son. He is the perfect Steiner. Many people say this. How dare you object to that? I respect your point of view, but I would say that Scott Steiner is the perfect Steiner. Ah. Oh. Damn it. Because he's more jacked. He's taller. He did crazier shit sooner. Uh, he, he cuts better promos. Uh, and he can run the ropes. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's what the what is Scott Steiner's physical state like? You were saying it was kind of carried by this and that. Is is he moving well or is he quite slow? He, uh, he's not. He's not. He's not going to take like excess risks at this mm. point. But he's he, he moves fine. He looks fine. You know, there's a little bit of sag to the to the muscles, but it it's cool. It's got Steiner, you know? You, yeah, yeah. You, you see him in 2015, you give him some leeway. I, I think he's still going, isn't he? I think. I know there was that, like, uh, there, there, was that horse, there was that Hornswoggle match I remember from recent years. Uh, oh, yeah. So I'm sure yeah. he still takes bookings. Yeah, and, and good for him. Like, he would do Legends shows and maybe some Mania Weekend stuff. That's cool. So um, there's a nice top rope belly to belly here Whoa. and RVD bumps nicely from that Gallows gives Steiner a fucked up looking steel chair 
<sighs> he make he he makes he makes like a mess of it. Like he he gives it to him wrong. And oh, no. RVD RVD has it in his hands now. And he kicks it into his face. <laughs> you can't you can't give R V D a chair. You <laughs> kick it into your face. <laughs> So wait, wait. And, uh, so wait. I I know how RVD does this stuff. So are you saying that Luke Gallows passed Scott Steiner a chair, and then he like, RVD he slid it, he oh. slid it under the bottom rope, and it went too far, and RVD's yep. like, I got this. But like, hold on here. So you're saying that RVD then takes a chair and then throws it to Scott Steiner to then kick it in his face. Yep, that is exactly how it went down. I think that could have been accomplished by like if Scott Steiner just got the chair and then RVD just spontaneously kicked it into his face instead of like adding that extra step. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, kind of weird. I didn't really think about that. Oh, gallows, gallows! You messed up, gallows! You are a terrible, you are a terrible manager, a company man, like. Gallows, you're a dumb motherfucker. I'm laughing at Gallows. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that earns RVD to win. Everybody, oh. everybody lambast Luke Gallows for costing Steiner. And this. But then, oh no, there's a beatdown. Bret Hart, oh. who was introduced earlier, is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> but holy fuck! Holy fuck! His Goldberg. What? Goldberg. <laughs> oh shit. Goldberg. Oh Spit my god. Steiner, Jack Hammer to Gallows. Yeah. Goldberg. Wow. If I was a fan at this Legends of Wrestling event, I would feel thoroughly serviced. Oh yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, I'm sure Bret Hart was gou- was like grouchy about it. To be in the same building as Goldberg. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I was I was trying to think there because like I know uh, Scott Steiner has like unworkable heat with like say like Hogan or Triple H. I was trying to think if he had similar levels of heat with like Goldberg, but no, I think I'm just getting that confused with like the he refused to follow the script match. <laughs> yeah, and R- RVD is ma- is apparently mates with Brett and Goldberg, so he's like he's the chaotic neutral we all need in our lives. Oh yeah, you know, he 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 he's cool. He can like uh, yeah, he can make friends with anybody. So the second RVD match I watched was from PCW cleared away. It was for the PCW Heavyweight Championship, where the defending champion Pentagon Junior faced wow. obviously RVD, and uh, I I liked this match from an early stage. Because RVD had like a piece of like ticker paper or confetti stuck to his face with sweat. <laughs> Rick Knox tries to pick it off him, but RVD's like he, he bores a fist and he's like, "Yeah, get off me!" Wow. Leave my wow. paper. Leave my paper alone. <laughs> <laughs> there's a sort of you know the the raw bad damn and the zero miedo. You know they they did the, they did the taunt off. Pentagon obviously really fucking loves a taunt off, and this point is this point is proven even more because they swap taunts. What? Like, Pentagon Pentagon does the thumbs, and RVD does the zero miedo. Like what? Wow, wow. Um, no, you took a you took a count of how long it took before Seagal got up in sniper. What about this match? How long before, you know, they wrestle? Well, they start punching in that? Yeah. I did, I did not I did not take uh, a time, but I did I did acknowledge that it was a fair bit of staring down. Like if we if we were blessed enough to get Roman versus the Rock, <laughs> maybe like maybe it would be like half of Roman versus Rock. Wow. Sort of stare down times. That's the unit of measurement. Yeah. I read this at half the on the tribal chief skill. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, RVD has he's got the working boots on in this one. Mm. Maybe he's just like um 
He's like, oh, thank God, I've completed the filming of Sniper Special Ops and I'm not injured. <laughs> so I can, I can really go for it in this time. What about, pe- what about um, Pedro? Is Pedro working? Pedro is... He's he's doing his thing. He's having his little... He's having his little bowler-type match. It's, it's, it's nice. Like, I'm... You know, but Penta, he has, like, kind of two types of matches. The ones where he goes kind of, like, hardcore. And the ones with, like, lots of kicks out, kick outs and stuff. Right. I'm right. usually not that into, like, the big kick out ones. But this this one worked for me. It's a nice, it's a nice setting. It's RVD. You can't go too wrong. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, the finish is like it's time for the it's time for the five star frog splash boy. <laughs> yeah. And R V D tries to do his taunt on the ropes, but he stumbles slightly, so it's like Rob, whoa <laughs> Damn. Oh, oh so he, fa- he, he doesn't do it over. I see, I see. Just rules of it. Yeah, I mean the the crowd were already the crowd already said van, so it's not like he can be like, excuse me, could everyone please restart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a momentary <laughs> lapse of balance. If everybody could just please restart the Rob Van Dam bit. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Thankfully, he he doesn't fall. He does the froggy, and he wins. New champ. <laughs> oh shit! Wow, wow. It's a, it's a pretty nice match. You can find it on uh, Russian Facebook. Your new politically correct wrestling champion from Bad Dam. For this one, uh, for Freddie Valentine, I went over to segundokaido.blogstop.com. Nice. If you search his name in that, then you will find the three matches that I watched. These were. These were very interesting matches. I think the the most interesting part about them was sort of how they were uh, put together because they they kind of like they feel half finished, but then they finish. Like it's not pace but, uh, it, appropriate to how the time is. Yeah, yeah. I think the the most the most obvious example of this is the third match I watched. But the first match was Terry Funk. You know, that guy. Wow. And Freddie Valentine against Mando Guerrero and Cincinnati Red. All of these matches take place in... Fuck, I forgot what the fucking promotion was called. Is it T... No, not TWA. I forgot what it's called. But it's kind of, it's kind of like an Irwams-esque setting. You know? Rotty little ring. Cozy venue with fans who you know if if they cough you can hear that yes yes it's, it's that kind of thing and uh there's some comedians for this match they're out and like leave that poor table alone what did oh. the table do to you the the table's inanimate mate it doesn't have feelings it's, it, you know, it's fine yeah i mean at, yeah. At, at one time it would have been like a tree and who knows if trees have emotions? We don't really know. But now it's now it's not. Definitely, it definitely doesn't have emotions. I just thought I'd point that out. So Thanks. Freddie Freddie Valentine is a wrestler. He does a like a it's a very strange spinning neck breaker where he lands like underneath his opponent. Uh huh. Like, like he'll do the neck breaker, but. The person he does the neck breaker to lands on him. <laughs> what the hell? That sounds weird. That does he? Yeah. He doesn't sell that like he's being hurt. If he just gets up like, yeah, I did a neck breaker. Yeah, he he just gets up like, yeah, I did a neck breaker, and it it went flawlessly. And if anybody has any issues with that, then you can <laughs> kiss my ass. This Mando Guerrero guy, he just kind of, he's not like there at the start. And then he just sort of materializes with like a plastic bin and starts bashing Funk in the head with it. And um, there's a very, I 
want somebody else to watch these matches and verify this because it sounds like uh, points the chair shots and the punches have like cartoon sound effects added to them like oh. <laughs> Like, like I know that's not what an actual punch sounds like. It's like it was. It was very strange. Like that I was just like that can't be the sound that they actually made. They must have added something in in post production. Mm. But, but like, why would you do that? <laughs> Bam! Pow! Yeah, like even if it's just because like oh it didn't make a much of a sound for like so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very obvious if you overdub sounds. But yeah, please, please check these out and just be like, yeah, they definitely went. Because I was like, what the fuck? Am I losing my mind? And then, yeah, this, this match ended um, suddenly, just like all of the others. Uh, there was like a random cut to a fireball spot and boom, finish. But it was a, it's a, it's a nice match. Jovial crowd. Table sympathizers. Yes, the, the the table sympathizers loved this one. And then we had Freddie Valentine versus Mando Guerrero in a barbed wire match. It's a uh, pretty funny brawl between two guys who move like they are constipated. But, you know, <laughs> I mean that as a compliment. Because, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with constipation, you know. Certainly not. We've all been there. Exactly. Constipation, diarrhea. You've got to feel the full, the full spectrum of sh- shits. Sort of <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, so, so they 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 fall in the constipation part of the doo scale, and that's how they move. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and like you know, I I, I imagine preparing for a wrestling match. You you know you get. Right, I got my knee pads, I got my boots. Oh, I forgot to have a shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. You know, it can't be easy. You know, you as a as a pro wrestler, even in the little leagues, you train so much, you prepare so much, and you put it all on the line. You might be out there, and you feel a fart coming on, and you think, oh, this is the one. It's gonna happen <laughs> while I'm doing the suplex. Oh no! Maybe it doesn't happen then, but soon it will. Exactly. Unless you unless you constipate. It. <laughs> <laughs> like you're actively trying to like beat constipation <laughs> while wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So the, the finish of this one again it ended quite suddenly. Um, is there the referee get punch? Then there's a nice vertical suplex for a bar wire board by Mando. But oh no, there's nobody to count it because the referee got punched. If you remember that little detail. <laughs> but then Valentine wins somehow, and I was typing this line and missed how he did it. So, uh, the third one I watched was Freddie Valentine against, I forgot how to pronounce this, it, it might be Craze? Yes. Or Crazy? It's the sort of thing that makes you think. Yeah. And uh, this was a exploding barbed wire boards match, aka Japanese suicide match. Whoa. Like they got in Japan. My god. So the setup of this is that it looks like electrified light tubes on the boards. So I guess that's where the explosions emanate from. And there's one in each corner. So I definitely look forward to four explosions. Uh oh. I hope I get all four. <laughs> so Valentine, he's got a little move where he uh, he rolls on his opponent, kind of like. If RVD did the uh, rolling thunder, is, is, and is, then does he do a jump into it? Is he just rolling? He just rolls on him, and then he gets up and drops an elbow. It, it's weird, but uh, <laughs> bless bless him. He's focused on directing, probably. <laughs> sure, sure. And it, he directed the shit out of that move. And uh, you, you know when uh, 
crowds at like hardcore wrestling shows chant like over here over here um kinda like what are they directing for like 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 when there's a like when there's a crowd brawl and and stuff they're like all right here yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) well we get like the antithesis of this because there's a very brief bit of crowd balling and a guy just yells get that shit away (laughs) that shit you paid for it man jesus christ (laughs) and yeah i this is another note about the punch sound effects. It really just like, like whoops. <laughs> so they take first big bump into the uh, little contraptions. First one, it kind of just sounds like a basic like light tube bump. It still gets a decent pop, but then they do the second one, and it has like a proper, an actually good like boom effect with like a small flame. As well, oh. and the people go, the people go ape shit for that one. Hell yeah! And then it ends. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> then it ends. Why'd they set the other two up? Well, it really helps the realism, doesn't it? I feel like that. I feel like that might be the thing with like all these matches. Just the way you're saying her abrupt finishes are like, oh, you know, you you really can never tell when a match is going to end. It might even end <laughs> when the story we've been building doesn't actually climax yet, but we're going to finish the match anyway. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's very committed to that particular uh, aesthetic of the match could end at any time. The crowd yeah. chant uh, two more lights because obviously only half of them get popped. It looks like Freddy is going to throw this random skinny guy into them. Like I don't know if he's a manager or something. But then he doesn't. Them shits is expensive. We can use that next time we have an exploding match to do. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I enjoyed sampling these uh, Freddie Valentine matches. He's an interesting man and wrestler. He he clearly doesn't care for traditional escalation in wrestling matches. Uh, it would be interesting to see if his movies have a similar thing going on. I don't know. Yes, I feel like you got like the worst possible intro to him, directorally. Perhaps, <laughs> but maybe there's like, maybe there's a bit like where they, it's like a sort of tense, scary bit, and then the credits just roll. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Who knows? I haven't seen seen one of his proper like old movies yet. So. Yeah, I bet that, that could be mean. something that we maybe return to in the future. Now we come to the. I was going to say the main event, but there is something after this that we will have to contend with as far as Ring of Honor. But now we come to, as we said at the start, this is the peak. This is the peak of Ring of Honor. This is the, <laughs> this is the standard that Tony Khan is trying to reach with his current ownership of the promotion. I don't think he's going to get there, Eva. I don't think he's going to get there. Fair play for him for trying, but I don't think he's going to get past Steven Seagal and Code of Honor. Um, Code of Honor, uh, you know, it's a movie that takes a it takes a lot of its wrong time to sort of show its cards, you know, as far as like what sort of movie it is. How it starts is that uh, I I initially thought it was actually quite like Hard to Kill, where you see Seagal, he's a uh, up on up on a place up high, and he he witnesses a crime meeting go down. And uh, with br- briefcase exchanges and all that, and we come to understand that the gangs at play here are, you know, the just whatever city this is in. This is filmed in Utah. I don't know if it's meant to be Utah. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of gangs here, like the White Boys, who are Nazis, um, and mm. then. Uh, and also other other dudes as well. They are exchanging money for drugs, and uh, there's a there's a dude who I think they they call him Mister X. He's this wiry sort of dude with a mustache and a cap, and the main guy of like the of the money side. It's like I'll have my FDA approval guy sample your product, and. 
Mr. X is like, haha, I am tasting drunk. Um, he says, I usually prefer ecstasy, but I'm an equal opportunity type of guy. So, you know, that's pretty cool. And then, a shot rings out. The first bit of it you see is that the bullet has went through the drug and it splattered a bunch of it all over Mr. X's face. And then it cuts to the guy <laughs> holding the briefcase who sees that and is like, oh no, bullet through me body? Ah, oh, and dies. <laughs> did, did you like the way that Stagal handled this? It's like, fuck your drug deal, shoot on sight. <laughs> Kablamo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, uh, not just attacking the people, but the immorality that they're peddling. Exactly. Damn junkies. Damn junkies. Um, and then, uh, after that, the assault furthers Seagal, shoots more, and this is the first instance of the special effects in this movie, which I, as far as a comparison point, I think of stick figure animations I saw on Newgrounds in 2006. Did you ever have the uh, the program Pivot? Yes. Yeah, I used that in high school. Make them like fight and fuck each other and shit. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, <laughs> and, you know, whenever you see like a uh, fucking like a uh, stick figure animation where like, oh, I'm gonna shoot this fucking stick figure then like the way they do blood splatter and explosion of faces. It's all basically how they do it in this movie. It looks very much like someone's drawn on top of like the frame in like Photoshop or something, you know? It always looks kinda like weird, like too smooth for like the frame rate as well. Um you know, and like the the like second shot after the drug one, it's like a guy getting his whole face blown half off. Oh my god, like it's you know, like <laughs> you see his jaw like wag around for like a frame or two. <laughs> and uh then, you know, this like small army of criminals all start to like they like figure out oh it's that guy up there in that tower uh, but they cannot shoot him uh, like literally he's not avoiding it or anything like that he motherfucker just sitting and he's just avoiding <laughs> all this gunfire um, and then like uh, you know a bunch of guys go down and like once the dust is settled Mr. X he like stands up and sees that the baggies of drugs are still there in the briefcase and he's like oh I'm Mr. FDA I can't just leave this here and then Seagal sees this and he snipes his wrist just like fuck, fucks up his wrist entirely um, and then the main bad guy of this whole affair he tries to get away with the money but luckily Steven Seagal thought of this because he takes a, a detonator and hits it and there's a bomb in the car and oh. as as the car goes up in flames, Court of Honor title drop. <laughs> Unbelievable. Court of, of Honor 2016 Michael Winnick. <laughs> I, did, uh, I did look up some other Michael Winnick movies. The, the synopsis or synopsis, I believe it would be. Mm -hmm. They sound very interesting. A lot, A lot of them are about like a dude wakes up somewhere and he's like, whoa, what the fuck? Yes, I, I, I remember like, you telling me about this, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this one disquiet from 2023. After a near-fatal car accident, Sam wakes to discover he is trapped in an abandoned hospital by mysterious and sinister forces that have no intention of letting him leave. So he's like, whoa, what the fuck? I was, just, I was just having a nap now. Sinister forces. Let me leave, forces. <laughs> wow. And then, uh, yeah, there's this one, Shadow Puppets from 2007. Director Michael Winnick's Ch Chilling Tales stars James Masters as Jack, one of eight captives who, who awaken in an abandoned asylum not knowing who they are or why they are together. So they're just like, oh. What? I, what? I'm sleeping. I'm... <laughs> yeah. They discover that they've been used in an experiment to erase disturbing memories, but instead a murderous cr creature has been unleashed. 
reaching out from the shadows, the monster hunts the eight strangers as they race to escape the asylum. Dude, what? Wow. wow. I was just having my mid-afternoon kip. <laughs> this one doesn't have waking up, but uh, Dark Asset 2023 also. If a director puts out two movies in the same year, that's how you know they're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It says, uh, pro- programmed for vengeance is the tagline. A charming guy attempts to pick up a woman in a bar by spinning a ta- tale involving spies, implanted microchips, and the dangerous military scientists hunting him. So, <laughs> a pickup artist, apparently. Wow. I feel like that could feed into one of the other movies, like they... They go to a hotel room, have sex, fall asleep, and then they're like, whoa, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably like how we would end up. I'd just like to point out one of the top review on Letterbox for Disquiet. It just yeah. says, what the fuck is this? Ha ha ha. That received 21 likes. Oh. What, what, did they give any rating? Uh... Yeah, one star. Oh. So, so it's not good. What the fuck? It's a bad what the fuck. Well. I'd like to... There's a a movie called The Duplicate from 2001. It's Michael Winnick's least popular on the Letterbox website. Really? Journalist Karen Adams is fighting to keep her sanity. It appears someone else has assumed her identity and is living her life better than she ever could. Losing a grip on her romance, her career and her friendships... Karen struggles to get her life back by exposing the imposter. But things take an unexpected turn when she discovers the true enemy is within herself. Oh, fuck. So yeah, that half half of those movies are about like waking up and being like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> and the other half are about like just like existential crises. Yeah, yeah. Um I suppose God of Honor falls into that second one. In, um, t- yeah, maybe. T- tangential way. But, you know, usually. So, uh, the strip club. Oh, th- not so fast, Eva. We have to talk about oh. the first repelling. Oh. Yes. Because the title drop, it just goes on right from there. It doesn't, like, cut to a different scene. Seagal just continues its rampage. He repels down the tower he was at. Slashes the dude up. Just fucks him up with a knife. Um, <laughs> and then he sees Mr. X walk away and he's like, okay. He just turns around and, uh, you know, goes to, goes off on his business. And then after that, the cops have to, have to do, uh, uh, you know, they have to get there and investigate. And this is where we, we, we first meet Peterson, my favorite fictional detective ever perhaps <laughs> <laughs> and you know he's there with his captain he says good morning captain and captain's like i don't think it's a good morning um so like uh you know they look at the damage like there's this car with like a bunch of burned up money so it couldn't be a financial thing what's the deal here and then peterson he sees a big tall tower and thinks from hmm, snape or um so he goes up there, and who do we see up on that tower but a besuited dude with sunglasses. And this is Porter, Special Agent Porter, played by Craig Sheffer, who I understand was on One Tree Hill. <laughs> he- <laughs> and he is he, he picks up a cigar stub. He chuckles to himself, he thinks you're still smoking cigars. And then Pearson holds him up, points a gun at him, and Porter's so cool about it. He does a cigar where, you know, he goes like, Oh, I, I bet you're holding a uh, standard issue handgun at me, but you're pointing at my back instead of that. And then <laughs> Peterson is like, Who are you? And then he shows him, I'm Special Agent William Porter, look at my badge. And you know what Peterson says in response? Fuck. Fuck! <laughs> so now, uh, Peterson is like, oh, man, this must have been many guys who did this. And Port's like, no, only one. 
and then uh, it cuts to the bad guy's house. Not the house, but you know, the club where they operate. And the main bad guy is one Mr. Romano, who, man, he actually just didn't do much, did he? Um, he, <laughs> he and like his, uh, his understudy, who I just refer to as Romano Cito, they are interrogating Mr. X. They're like, who did this? Who gave us the fucking go around with this shit, man? And Mr. X is like, oh, I don't know. I need to see a doctor and they won't let him. And then it's confusing because Mr. X comes back later as indeed a gang guy who wants to kill. But like they, they're like, take him away. And he goes, no, as if he's going to be killed. <laughs> but he doesn't get killed. So I don't know what happened. Um, but uh, yeah, then it goes to the, you know, over the course of the movie, this becomes such a su- such a homely atmosphere to me. Porter's hotel room, where Porter's there, yeah. he's got his fucking bottle in a brown bag, because like, you know, oh, he's a troubled guy. He gets liquor from the liquor store or whatever, and he's fucking. Yeah. Sick. If he if he pours a glass out with ice, then that's fine. But if he drinks it from the bottle in a bag. Oh, he's he's got issues, this boy. It's a sign of trouble. And he also has <laughs> a baseball glove, which he plays with meaningfully. Um, and then one of the, probably the first instance of green screen is the news. News got some coverage to do. Um, this shit looks like some Neil Breen ass shit. Um, looks like, uh, you, you ever see like those old uh, museum videos? Museum videos? museum uh it was like this 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 like i think a museum attraction where like oh you could like green screen yourself onto the news and you know it was just like oh, oh we, we go to our special report now and it's just some kid go like <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> so it reminds me of that these like two people who are just like oh they are they are reading lines certainly they are saying them um and <laughs> we go to this strip club don't we eva Oh hell yeah! So he it's a it's a pretty empty strip club, and uh, cigars just go up in at the naked ladies. But don't worry if it, if that feels unsettling, then he's got a gun. You know. Yeah. That yeah. should put that should put everyone at ease. That the one guy in the strip club, just gawping at the uh, dancers, he's got a gun. So if any if any shit goes down. He's got, he's got you covered. See, I, I, I see him as being a very cerebral uh, operator here, you know? Like, you see all these shots of him, like, uh, you know, he'll be, like, looking around, holding his fucking stogie in his fingers. It looks so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but did you think of the uh, depiction of nightclubs here, where the oh. music was, like, unspeakably quiet? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, unspeakably quiet music. Um, you know, like, the it's it's really fucked up to do this like scene in the daylight as well like just have this whole nightclub atmosphere <laughs> but like make it clear this is in the day um it it looks incredibly yeah, like see. uh yep yeah the two p.m. strip bar you know two p.m. strip bar uh you know I, I I don't know if I've ever had like uh the highest opinion of like you know I I, I never thought of myself oh I'd love to go to a strip club but. If this was the one bit of reference media, I'd be like, yeah, I don't want to come here. It just looks like a bunch of guys sitting around, like, nose-telling titillation, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, it's I, a... I mean, and that would be doubly confirmed once Segal gets out of the club. And he bombs the fucking place. He bombs the fucking place. So, like, I think what's going on here, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of, like... Uh, I can't remember what the phenomenon is where you put one shot after the other and it indicates like, oh, this is a reaction to that. But like Sagal is just looking around, like kind of like, Ugh. and then it'll cut to a sort of like a guy receiving money, and then it'll cut to oh that guy's packing heat, and then there's this wonderful, wonderful shot where it goes zoom, 
and shows you like the accounting room and where they store the guns. I like to think that Seagal's observational skills just work so well that he can picture the club in his mind just by looking and like you can just see all that. And you know, then we have uh, the introduction of Kerry. Kerry, one of the most important characters, the stripper, who her son is sick. Her son, her son. And she has to be like, hey, could you cover my shift on a stripper? And she's like, yeah. Because she's doing coke. <laughs> um, and then, like, uh, yes, during the strip tease, Sakal gets up, walks out of there. Boom. <laughs> Just fucking walks away from this strip club, which he has just exploded, exploded. Um, yeah, it, it's it's not a good. Uh, I guess they're trying to depict strip clubs as like dens of sin, but you know, it didn't even look like fun sin. You know. No, and do you think the blowing on the strip club where there's still people inside? Do you think that's ad- adhering to the code of honor? I have my doubts. <laughs> Well, I think uh, you'll have to judge yourself as as a, as a personal human being um, whether, you know, strip clubs are sports entertainment crap. But by going there, are you <laughs> also indulging in sports entertainment crap? That's a question that one has to work out for themselves, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think so. And so then, uh, you know, uh, Porter's just been sleeping this entire time and then you know, he gets woken up, it's a big fucking gaunt stare at the TV <laughs> because like, oh, we've just got another making use of the destruction of the city's most notorious strip club. Um, and then, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it goes to the scene where everyone's outside crowded around like, oh my god, who exploded the strip club? Kerry comes back and sees her co-workers who are not dead, just a bit shaken up by it. It's like, oh no! And Porter is there, along with Peterson and Peterson's partner, who I can't remember her name, I don't think they even say, and Romano Cito's also there. He is like, wait a minute, that's a stripper who was in the club, I will film her, and then, you know, that'll, that'll fucking come to some shit. And then, uh, by this point, Porter and Peterson, they're working together, it's sort of like, you know, the local police and the FBI, the Fed, and... You know, they're talking when suddenly Porter looks off in the distance. He sees Steve Seagal. And Steve Seagal sees just like, yeah. and walks off. And he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> you get back here. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, you know, chases after him. There's no one there. And Peterson's like, who, who is this? And, and he goes, it's William Sykes. A colonel who I looked up to in the army and he fucking protects moral fiber because his family were killed in a drive-by by gangs um so fucking yeah and he he and there's a weird thing where Porter says that Sykes is straight but we saw the stogie so I don't know what the fuck is up with that um but yeah this is where Colonel William Sykes, Steven Seagal's character, is explained. We know who he is now. And as far as we know, he's gone rogue. He is a serial killer now. Just like murdering people for being bad guys. Um, they call him the uh, super vigilante. The super vigilante. And yeah, yeah. So they're going to go after him. Detective... Peterson and Agent Porter, they don't like each other. They're going to get to Sykes if they can help it. Um, now we come to uh, just like, there are some parts where, like, you know, it'll just be a scene of like William Sykes com- committing justice on people who are doing sins and it doesn't have any bearing on the plot. It doesn't really come up any later. But it just it's there to pad out the thing. So, you know, uh, this first one will be like two gang members wearing wife beaters. The cops are arresting them. And then Steven Chagall's like, nah, I'm going to shoot them. Pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then uh, after this, it then comes to Romano Cito comes back and it's like, 
oh, your strip club blew up, Mr. Romano, and, you know, I, I like, was watching that stripper. Porter talked to her, and she was like, I saw a guy. So, hey, we should go after her and get that info. And Mr. Romano, he's very mad about the strip club being blown up. So he's like, get me that girl now. Um, and then, uh, similarly... Porter is looking for info on this lady because, you know, he could have gone for information, but he saw Steven Seagal and ran away. So what else could he do but go to, like, an abandoned warehouse where there's a wee dusty PC that has, like, a hard drive on it that apparently has the information of everyone on it because he could just find her address off of this PC. <laughs> um, and then... He goes outside and there are dudes there. And they try killing him, so he stabs them both. Oh. And then, you know, that's the end of that scene. Um, <laughs> what do you think of Kerry? The character of Kerry? He's like the uh, detective guy? No, Kerry is a stripper. Oh. <laughs> See, I, I wrote about like nine notes on this movie. I was, I was keeping my like eyes open with matchsticks practically <laughs> like most of it so my, my notes are very sparse wow Carrie, Carrie, what what a woman <laughs> she, <laughs> she she is uh you know she's a kind soul she has a son and like that was the main thing about her that i thought is that like the way she says my son it's like if you took M. Bison and, t- and cut the B out. She just always goes, my son, my son, my son. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, it's weird because they portray her as having an, a, like, you know, she's a stripper and she has an apartment, but she sends her son off to school and, like, is in the suburbs, I'm pretty sure, right? So, like, there's a bit inconsistent with that. And then, you know, then she, like, uh, is just there as someone who's uh, who's being threatened, you know? Because, like, Mr. Romano and Porter, they're both trying to find her to, you know, find shit out. Or, in Porter's case, to protect her because they're going to kill her. And then, you know, this is where we get, like, uh, you know, <laughs> the film's perhaps most notorious character Jerry Simons the reporter who is who reveals <laughs> the cynical nature of news broadcasts um, he like showed up at the start to be like oh look at this people died here but then around this point in the movie I think they really decide to like go in on him as like oh he's a character who who, who loves ratings more than truth but you know, he never really distorts the truth, <laughs> as far as I can see. Because, <laughs> like, he, he has this report on the strip club bit where he pulls up footage of, like, hey, look at this guy. And it's Porter. And they're like, we, we someone should talk to that guy. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. We don't know who that guy is. Um, and uh, I love, too, how in movies like this, there's, like, a new thing on, and fucking everyone's watching it. It cuts to fucking Peterson. He's watching it. It cuts to Mr. Romano and his fucking crime gang home. He's watching it too. They're all fucking glued to the news. They want to know what's going on. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And yeah, then there's the first clue. that There's something off about Porter because Romano Cito was there for when Porter killed those two guys. And he was like, they killed him with a knife. And Romano's like, I don't think he's a fed. Feds don't kill people with hunting knives. But Porter, he said he was a fed. What the fuck? Oh my god, oh my god. And then we go right to Kerry's house because Romano's goons have succeeded. Mr. X comes to Kerry's house and, you know, he and two other guys are like, oh, what's up with the strip club? Who blew it up? Who was that guy? And she don't know. So they're about to kill her. And then Porter knocks on the door and the guys are like, oh, answer him and be cool about it. And then he's like, hello, it's me, Porter. <laughs> and Gary's like, it's not a good time. And Porter just goes, it never is. 
boom, just fucking gets in there, starts murking the fuck out of people. And then after that, I swear that it looks sort of like a suburban sort of house that she lives at, like both in that scene and also a scene where she like drops her son off at the school bus stop. Um, but then like the next shot is of them running into like an alleyway in a big city. Um, so like I'm not entirely sure about the consistency of the geography TBH, but you know there are more goods there. There's a uh, like this fucking like pickup truck pulls up and uh, one of the guys sits uh, with a big ponytail says to the radio I'm in the alley and you know from there <laughs> uh, Porter is you know fucking fighting these dudes off the big ponytail guy he gives them like fucking like he like stabs one boop and then another boop and then punches him and uh, you know so it's all going well but then uh he murks everyone, but then X-Man, Mr. X, he's got a gun pointed at him, but then well, Kaploi, fucking pivot bloodstain, shows up on his face and he <laughs> falls down. Who's behind him? It's Steven Seagal. And, you know, the, he looks at Porter, and Porter looks at him, and the first line that Steven Seagal says in this movie, What's wrong with you, man? You're slipping. <laughs> Cajun well, yeah, Steven him... Seagal. It took, it took him fucking ages to talk, right? Yeah, he he was just kind of like he he like his first point of the gun, but then he's just kind of like he's got his, he's got his hands folded, just looking at him. What's wrong, with you, man? Have you already discussed his confrontation in a nightclub, where it's kind of like a who's the real bad guy? Oh, that's that's later on, Eva. That's later well, on. Okay. okay. Oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's my next no- I think my notes were like a, ha- a half hour apart each <laughs> <laughs> so it's like yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but here uh, you know like they actually set up that confrontation because uh, first of all uh, Seagal is just telling him like uh, I appreciate you taking care of some of the bad guys that's cool of you <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, like you know, they're, they're, they're having this conversation where it's like not very connected. They're just kind of saying like lines to each other back and forth, like, "How about you do what I do? Will you do? And I do what I do. We'll see who comes out on top." Okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then Seagal asks him, "Would you give your life to save the whole world if nobody knew you did it?" And Porter doesn't give an answer. And Seagal's like, "That's different between you and me." We, you, you're not gonna tell me when we sell this. I'll tell you. We'll sell this tomorrow at midnight, and then like uh, I think yeah, they they say like to do it at the club where they meet up, and this this there's a fucking okay. This movie is edited terribly. There's a lot of terrible <laughs> editing in this movie, and no example sticks out further to me than there's a. The shot is on Seagal. He's saying, we'll do this tomorrow. I'll see you there. He does not then turn around and leave. It cuts to another shot of him turning around and leaving. (laughs) And it it just looks so fucking hokey. And there are many other examples of this which we shall get to. Um, Then, uh, you know, before this confrontation takes place, there's some more world building to do. Because... Uh, Jerry Simon's back. He's on the news, and he's saying that you know, since the super vigilante's been around, crime has went down. The people love it. They love this vigilante, and then like I love the, when crime down. <laughs> the, the mayor is around, and Jerry Simon. You know, he is like he he's a freaking ambulance chaser type, he's always wanting to scoop off of people, and the mayor is like, I will give no comment about this, except to increase my electoral chances, please vote for me, haha, <laughs> and then he leaves. But, you know, it doesn't just get left there, because uh, he steps into his limo, and there's a lady there, a freaking secretary type, and he starts eating her up. 
just fucking blah, 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 and the flips and stuff. <laughs> and the limo driver, he turns around just like, Mr. Mayor, your wife is on line too. And the mayor's like, ah, tell her I'm in a meeting. And the limo driver's like, oh, you darn mayor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then like, uh, you know, everybody's just watching this news. It, 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 there's, there's a part where like, uh, it's after Jerry Simon uh, fails to get like a good comment out of the mayor. Then the cameraman, Neil, he's there. And Jerry Simon is like, what do you think of him, Neil? And Neil is like, I think he's an asshole. And then like Neil is just kind of looking at Jerry Simons with bedroom eyes as well. I noticed that, um, you know, like they're basically a couple. And uh, so then we go from there to yet another uh, bit of a uh, bit of justice from Colonel William Sykes, because uh, before there had been a, a bit where there's a pimp who is like, hey, Where's my money be at? And then just the call was like, I shoot you now. Bam, bam, bam. And then here, there's a drug deal taking place where uh, the drug dealer is like, hey, you you got no money for the drug deal. And lady, the lady who wants the drugs is like, I will suck your dick for the drugs. And the guy's like, hey, no way. Do not suck my dick. Last time, you bit my dick with your teeth. And then she is like, oh, I promise I will not do that this time. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> then Seagal decides to shoot the guy. And then, like, shoot a bunch of the other ones uh, that are there. And, like, uh, there, there are two which I think of right now, which is one of, one of the guys who goes down. It's literally, like, you directed him, okay, like, fall down like you have tripped, and we will just edit a bunch of bullet holes onto your body in post. He doesn't, like, ricochet from the impact or anything like that. He just, like, uh, just falls down with, like, six bullet holes in him. <laughs> um, and then the other one, this is another brilliant bit of special effects here. There's a guy who is, like, tying, like, electrical cord around himself just for no reason. And then what happens is Seagal shoots him and he falls into a puddle of water, electrifying him, electrocuting him rather. And so like there's just like bzzz, bzzz, so good like literally looks like if you like drew like with a white pen lines. It looks so shit. It looks so bad. Um <laughs> so yeah, that happens. And now uh we have to we have to like calm down a bit, get the human angle of this. Carrie shows up to Porter's hotel room with her son. And, um, you know, her son is named Corey. It's a very funny bit where, like, they come in and there's, like, an awkward stare between, like, Porter and Corey, who, like, is, like, stands up. <laughs> and then, like, uh, uh, Corey asks Porter, are you a good guy or a bad guy? And he's and Porter's like, what does your mother say? She thinks you're a good guy. And Porter's like, how old are you? You're six years old? Ah, oh, that, that was how old my son was last time I saw him. So, you know, this is the quiet part where you really learn about Special Agent Porter. You learn, you know, oh, he, he has lost his life to this profession. And now this obsession with Colonel Sykes this will further remove him from humanity but thankfully Carrie and her son will be safe here it goes back to the station where you know this kind of follows on from the prior news part where you know oh, public opinion it's in the super vigilante's favour so now the police are like infighting about it um, you know like you talk about God, oh, there's no crime no more we're going to be out of a job and, uh, you know, then, like, Peterson, he does make a good point here, where he says, like, oh, well, you know, tomorrow, maybe he'll just start shooting kids up, we don't know. And, you know, it's like, damn, that's that's the reason not to just have a super vigilante in charge of crime. <laughs> um, and then Porter walks in, they're like, where were you? And he says, I was being drunk. And, you know, damn, that's crazy. Then he says, he tells them that he's got a meeting set up with Sykes. They're going to be at the fucking club 
in the Devil's Garden. And I'm going to play this clip here, if you can get back in the stream again, of uh, what is it that, you know, they, they say like, oh, what, why did you, what, why did you agree to that? And what does Porter say? It was the honorable thing to do. <laughs> yeah! Yeah, that's right! Honor! <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he says, like, oh, if Sex sees any cubs, he's gonna disappear. So, you know, they, like, basically make it so, like, he's got a wire and stuff. And they're gonna be, like, doing a stakeout. The scene is set then. Mr. Romano's club, the Devil's Garden. Porter's going in. And, oh, if you thought the club music was great in the other ship club, the music here is, like, fucking, like, a big crushed guy going, We go pop bottles. We go get drunk. <laughs> we go pop balls. <laughs> and then, you know, suddenly he runs into Sigal. Like, oh, he's there. Hello. That's, that's like one of my five memories from this movie. It's just like the way that they play the music, it sounds like you're on the outside. Like you could bring the microphones inside and it would sound like a nightclub, but you're on the outside. Yes, yes. There, there's like a, a fucking low pass filter on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the girl's there and you know uh, they like Colonel Robert Sykes offers them a cigar he offers Porter a cigar and he's like I don't smoke it anymore it's, uh, he, he can't help but laugh <laughs> you? Who, you you've never met a cigar you didn't smoke a drink you didn't drink <laughs> and a woman you did not fuck and now suddenly he's clean. It's crazy. And then Porter goes like, what the hell happened to you, Sykes? And then uh, he, he laughs again. Hey, man, I never went soft. That's what happened to me. I still love my country. I still have my family, even though they're gone. Um, and basically he's explaining that he's an honorable soldier. He took an oath, as did Porter, to defeat enemies of the country. So... You know, these dangerous areas in America now where you can't walk around without getting uh, beat up and killed. Seagal says, we don't accept it in other countries. Then it cuts. Why accept it in ours? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I, I really have to imagine a lot of the fucking editing here is like Seagal fucked up a line and then like, I don't know, he was available like one day. So they realize, like, oh, shit, that <laughs> sounds bad. We can't recall him back. <laughs> um, and, you know, Porter is the devil's advocate here. He is like, oh, so who's going to decide good and evil? Then you? And then, you know, uh, Seagal's just like, that's right and wrong. And these laws, which I'm breaking, they're meant to serve us. You know what was that law? Slavery. And if it weren't for people like us, it may still be around. And then, you know, while this intellectually stimulating conversation is going on, Romano Cito, he's watching on the TV, on the cameras, and he sees Porter, and whoever's on the other side of the table is obscured by a pillar. Hmm. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Seagal turns the tables on Porter, because Porter said all this and that about him being a mole, but he's like, oh, what about you then? I never missed a soccer game. I never cheated on my wife or my taxes. You fucked everything that moved forward and domestic. And, you know, then Porter is like, oh, well, yeah, but I've got the police here. Come in, boys. And then you know what the girl is like? He's like, I knew you'd go for that. So here's a jamming device. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. And, and uh, the Seagal goes, I'm done fucking with you. Uh, and then he stands up to leave. And Poor is like, don't move at all. I got a gun. And then Seagal doesn't give a shit. He's like, I, uh, I put a bomb under your chair. <laughs> so you better not move. Otherwise, I'll blow it up. And everybody going to die, is what he says. Um, and then... <laughs> 
uh this is something that like took me a while to like figure out but basically mr romano's good show up and start fighting with porter and porter does not leave his chair i realized a, a, a wee bit into it that oh it's because he can't get up otherwise it'll blow up so oh he's got to do a chair battle which is pretty fun you know like uh it's got like uh nice wee bits of action to it and then you know like he just like, murked everyone well like it's not as if he just like sits cigar style he like falls down and it's just still on the chair has to scoot about in it you know i think it's pretty impressive um and then like he he kneecaps romano cito and kills him kills like one of the main bad guys uh, that we've seen thus far in the movie and then here's mr romano himself who you know his approach to shooting a gun is akin to doing some work with the hose in the garden. <laughs> I could not believe the way this guy fucking shoots a gun. Was it sub Seagal? Absolutely sub Seagal. Like, uh, <laughs> li 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 literally, he, he, like, he has no, like, stance. It it's literally as if, like, you just, like, uh, like, you know, the, the, the way one would be standing normally and he just, like, fucking, like, like literally like no feeling or emotion to it just like uh what is shit going there and it's fucked up because like <laughs> this method uh leads to like one of the few successful moments of pain for our hero because Porter gets shot in the hand oh no and you know just as that happens the police come in they are like uh oh we heard all the commotion so peterson he arrests Romano, and Romano's like, ha, 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 me no care about this. And then Porter, they ask Porter, like, oh, what happened? And then he's like, oh, I used a jamming device. And then he put a bomb under my chair. And then they're like, what? there's no bomb under this chair. So he looks like a crazy man talking about this non-existent bomb. Um, and then from there, you know, ambulances are out. Porter gets his hand taped up. And Peterson's like, uh, okay, I've got, got, got to go over here for a second, but don't go anywhere. And then turns around and uh, he's like, Where, where'd Porter go? And the, whole, but the fucking ambulance guy's like, I don't know. So, you know, <laughs> Peterson's not doing a good job. And uh, there's there's a wee, this wee fucking thing where one of the police guys is like, oh, that's static from the jammer sounded more like Porter turned off his wire instead of a jamming device it's like what the fuck's going on there oh my fucking god and you know the all, all the shit and stuff it has bigger consequences that will come up later but now we have to go back to the hotel room because Porter is there and Carrie's also there because she's staying there and She's like, oh my god, your hand. And he's like, ah, it's fine. Uh, like, we got Romano. And, you know, she's like, oh, does that mean I'm okay? And he's like, no. No. Um, and then they, like, look to Corey, who is sleeping. And Corey's wearing the baseball glove that Porter treasures so closely, seemingly because it was his son's. And he feel emotion at that. And he's like, I gotta stop Colonel Sykes. So he's gonna do that. And then, do you remember who the big casualty of the Devil's Garden shooting was? Of course, that time. <laughs> <laughs> Why it was not other than it was not other than the daughter of a senator. <laughs> no. <laughs> and she shows up at the morgue with Detective Peterson. And she sees the body. It's like, oh, that is her. That is my baby girl. And Peterson is like, I'm so sorry, Senator. And she is an asshole to Peterson. She's like, oh, is that so, Detective? You got your guy now. You're going to get a big promotion, you fuck. And then, you know, she walks away and Peterson looks sad. I feel bad for him. Um, and then, oh, Jerry Simons, fate comes for him. Because he is in his van with Neil. Uh, and then, like, he's getting in there. And he sees a letter left for him. And what, what, what does it say? He picks it up and it says, Ratings gold! 
<laughs> and he opens it and is like, oh, come to the old strip club. You don't bring police. I don't bring guns. He's like, oh boy, ratings gold. I want that. Neil, let's go. And, and then, uh, you know, so, oh, I don't know how that's going to end up for our favorite newscaster ever. Um, but in the meantime, the police are going to go for the, the CCTV footage of the Devil's Garden shooting. They see exactly what Romano Cito saw, where Porter is talking to someone. But where is the someone? We don't see him at all. And there's a, there's a moment of, like, uh, where they see the daughter of the senator, who, like, you know, the daughter got shot, and the chief says, oh... At least he wasn't shot by one of ours. And then Peterson gives him a look like, are you freaking kidding me with that callousness? Um, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> again, like, the, it, it's fucked up. They're, they're like these wee things which, like, have the semblance of, like, coherence and maybe emotional depth. But the way it's cut always disrupts the emotion, you know? It's never, it never feels smooth. Um, mm. And uh, then... The captain is like, oh, why was she in a place run by the mob? And Peterson's like, do you know who owns all the places you've been to, captain? And he is shut the fuck down by that. Uh, and then it's up to Peterson and partner to transport Romano uh, for his trial. And then it cuts to outside the courthouse in daytime. Uh, Jerry Simons is talking to the attorney. Who is like, oh, Mr. Romano is so innocent. These charges will not stand. And then Jerry Sam is like, holy shit, that's Mr. Romano coming out of the courthouse. He like bumps past the attorney. And, you know, Mr. Romano, he's being led out, being asked all these questions. And he, you know, is about to get put into the police car. But he stops for a second to look around and smile. And then, bam, gets fucking head exploded. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> so fuck it. Uh, you know, Pearson's right there, so he gets just like an explosion of blood on his face, and then was like, oh no, what happens? And then the largest zoom ever occurs. This is like uh, just insane, like how far it goes, uh, where supposedly Colonel Sykes perched up there, motherfuckers just sitting. And he sniped that dude <laughs> from very far away. And then after this, uh, you know, Mr. Romano, he did. All the bad guys did. And Peterson is just left with, like, there, there's a scene which, again, it'd be so easy, I think, to have, like, a moment of just something, anything, where he's, you know, he's looking into the mirror, the camera's on the mirror, he's looking into it, he's washing up his fucking blood-stained body, you know, and his clothes, he's just staring into himself, it'd be so easy to have something that resembling, like, poignancy, or anything emotionally, and it, it just doesn't reach it, because it's edited so bad, so bad, <laughs> and uh, then, like, uh, his partner comes up, is like, somebody's here to see you, and it's Carrie. Carrie's here with her son, and she's like, we need your help, because Porter's like, oh, you should go to the police, and she's like, okay. Then it cuts to uh, one of the funnier sequences in the movie. I, I, I don't know if you remember this, the one where, like, the mayor is having a speech, and he's like, oh, I hate the super vigilante, and then, well, like, both Porter and Sykes are watching it. And, like, they're both gearing up for a final showdown in each other's hotel rooms, you know? Like, so, uh, it's very interesting because this is really the point where you see a difference between, like, a Porter and a Steven Seagal. Uh, like, you know, Porter, who I am not even calling the actress name anymore, it's just the character to me, and Seagal, who's <laughs> so much more of a star. So, like, Seagal... His fucking, like, setup thing is, like, you know, he's got all these fucking guns here, and he's assembling them all, and, like, checking out the sights, like, aiming them and stuff. He's, like, he's got, like, fucking compressed air that he, like, squishes into, like, his magazine to make sure it's all cleared up and stuff. And just all this stuff where, 
oh, he looks like a badass. But, you know, what does Porter do? He, like, puts on a tactical vest, and that's about it. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, and then, like, uh, the mayor is like, oh, this domestic terrorist, the super vigilante, I will stop him. And Porter's watching and be like, oh, you shouldn't have said that. So, you know, like, uh, that that's all fucked up and stuff. And then we go to the police station where Kerry is talking to fucking Peterson. And Peterson is like, did you ever see Colonel Sykes at the club? And she was like, no. Uh, and, you know, basically, uh, Peterson started to become suspicious of Porter. So he's like, uh, oh, what's the deal with this Porter guy? And she's like, especially should Porter saved me and my son. And then she just casually drops it like, oh, she, he, he killed a bunch of guys in my house. And Pierce is like, what? He killed those guys? What? And, <laughs> and then uh, he gets called away, this Peterson, because there are some FBI agents, Donovan and Franks. And he goes like, oh, that first guy you said did a real bang up job. And they're like, huh? We are the first here. And he's like, you don't know a special agent porter? And we're like, no, we do not. Holy fuck. Uh, so, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Porter ain't no agent at all. So now they have to have a raid on Shea Porter, his big hotel room. It's so fucked up to see. After a whole <laughs> movie's worth of getting used to this place, it's, it's, you know, you think of uh, uh, places like, say, the bar in Cheers, the Enterprise on Star Trek, and Porter's Hotel Room. Just these, It's so fucked up to see this place just, like, driven through, you know? And so sad to see uh, Peterson sees a kid and a wife photo. And at this point, I figured out the twist. I predicted it. And then it came true. <laughs> <laughs> just, just curious. How long did it take you to figure out a twist? If you did, beforehand. I. I could have <laughs> been, like semi-conscious during during the twist. Oh, okay. I see. I see. <laughs> uh... <laughs> like, if you wanna, if you wanna know. Like the 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 formation of my notes, yes. It's like it's the who's the real bad guy bit, and then I say this has felt one thousand years long, <laughs> and then I say green screen helicopter laughing my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like forty five minutes apart. Well, I'm sorry, but I've constructed the, the finished yeah, poem on God of Honor's story. <laughs> if it was just me, I would not have much content for a podcast about Code of Honor 2016 so. <laughs> well on that note we now go back to Snake Eyes the strip club where indeed Jerry Simons he wants that reading goal baby he's coming to here to meet the super vigilante and so he goes in it's all dark but then a flare is lit up it's Steven Seagal and he goes hello Jerry <laughs> Which is, you know, what you would set on the side belt. <laughs> um, and then, like, this goes back to my initial point on the character of Jerry Simon. He is portrayed as a, a critique of the news industry. Their willingness to twist facts and sensationalise all for the sake of ratings. Steven Seagal tells them, you know, the only thing that surprised me, Jerry, is how much you lie. And he's like, I only report the news. And I agree with him. He never really says a lie throughout this story, I think. He's a bit of a obnoxious guy, but fucking hell, come on now. You know, it's fine. He's, he's, he's just reporting the fantastical news of there being bombings and shit. And then Steven Seagal says, truth is absolute. People are subjective. <laughs> <laughs> And it went well it's going down, you know, Neil's there, the cameraman, and Seagal tells him, Don't worry, son. I know you're just trying to follow orders. Um, so 
initially that makes me think, okay, Jerry's probably going to die, but Neil will be fine. He's going to let Neil live. Um, and Jerry Simons begins the interview. He says, who are you? And David the goes, I'm just a man with a plan. And then it cuts in the middle of the sentence. <laughs> absolutely pathetic film making I think um, and then it kind of <laughs> yeah fuck you Winnick I don't care about your fucking like oh I woke up somewhere in movies <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I kind of do but uh, it's sort of <laughs> and so uh, you know uh, I can't remember the exact question at least this but like uh, yeah like Jerry Simon's like what is this plan and Steve's goes, oh, it looks a bit something like this. And then he, like, throws a knife at Neil's throat, killing him. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I thought he was going to be spared, but no. And then Jerry Simons goes, oh, oh, I thought you said no weapons. And then Steve's goes, like, no, I said no goods. That's not good. Then he goes, <laughs> <laughs> so the news is dead now. <laughs> Nobody on the news. Um cuts back to Porter's room where, uh, you know, the police are like, what the fuck's going on here? And Porter calls the cop car. So, you know, the cop car's like, hey, Agent Porter here. And, yeah, you know, Pierce is like, oh, we know about, yeah, fuck it, we know you're not a fed. And Porter's like, I'm not a lot of things. <laughs> um, he's just a man trying to atone for his sins, is what he says. Uh, he also claims that the mayor's the next target and the Jerry Simon show just went off the air. So then, like, uh, they track it down, like, oh my god, that call came from the Snake Eyes Club payphone. So, hmm, interesting. Um, <clears throat> and then when they, when they hear that about the mayor, obviously, they're like, oh fuck, we gotta protect the mayor now. Where is he? We don't know. Uh, you know, the whole idea is like he's cavorting so much that you can't rely on him to be at his office. He's always f- fucking some lady that's not his wife. Um, so they have difficulties with that, do the police forces. Um, they go to the Snake Eyes Club where, you know, they, they've tracked down the camera, but there's no memory card in it. Oh my god. Um, and Peterson's partner pulls up the files on both Sykes and Porter. It says that Sykes, he was a cool-ass soldier, very honourable, but Porter, he got discharged dishonourably after Sykes disappeared. So this is where the movie moves into, like, being a saw ripoff with its use of, like, whoops, psh, psh, flashbacks. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um... Like, you know, he sees the cigar stub at the payphone, and it's like, oh, holy shit, it's just like this thing at the tower, and it goes <laughs> and then it, like, flashes forward to, like, oh, it was an empty chair at the devil's garden! Oh, uh, what's good? Uh, and then, oh, it's like, all of the shots where Steven Seagal was, <gasps> Porter's there! Was he the super vigilante all along? And, like, you know, something I have been thinking yeah. about a lot. Something I've been thinking about a lot. Like, to further the whole thing of Seagal being so much cooler than Porter, it's like, in the, when he lights up the flare, Seagal has, you know, his leg gets fucking cut off midway, but, like, he's got something, like, cool going, right? You know what Porter says when he gets asked, like, who are you by Jerry Simons? He goes, I'm your super vigilante. Like, okay, man. <laughs> You is a nerd. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, it appears now that actually Steven Seagal was playing a character that doesn't exist. Wow. <laughs> this this is a step above Sniper Special Ops, where he's not the main character. Now, he was not a character at all. <laughs> what do you say, good at? You didn't see him. <laughs> Sounds interesting. I'll, I'll have to check that movie out one day. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
you know, then they figure out, oh, the mayor is at a hotel, he is uh, fucking having sex with a lady, and then we see this shot of a guy walking into a hotel room and shooting the mayor, and we don't see the face, we don't know whether it's Porter or Sykes, and then, it's up on the roof of this place, there's Steven Seagal, he's like, knelt down, and Porter comes up to him and points a gun at him, and then he he's like got him held up because like you know at the alleyway, Segal was like, oh what you forgot to check your six, and so now at this point, Porter's like, ah I guess you forgot to check your six too, haha, <laughs> and then, uh, one of my favorite line deliveries from Segal here is like, uh, oh I was I was wondering what you're gonna get here, man. I was starting to get lonely. <laughs> So good, disarm so easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, like, uh, <laughs> like it's, it's strange how the girl talks is like, somehow everybody's thinking that you're me and I'm you. That's a nice touch, man. That's some cool shit. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, he asks the question again of like, uh, would you give your life to save the whole world if nobody knew you could do it? Porter goes, my life? Yeah, sure. Everybody else's? No. And then <laughs> what follows is like more spectacularizing because Seagal goes, well, cut. I'm done. And that's the <laughs> conversation. <laughs> and then, you know, it's time for him to fight fist to fist with a knife. Uh, it's like, you know, Seagal hits like a, a stance which, like, you know, once he does, it, they hit, like, an oriental gong. So, you know, that's a wonderful touch, isn't it? Um, do you remember anything of this climactic fight between Steven Seagal and the One Tree Hill guy? <laughs> Not really. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't uh, It wasn't a great fight, I feel. Uh, like, there, was no, there was no ripping out of a larynx. There was no stabbing in the top of the head. Yeah, absolutely not. And I would like, have definitely written that down. <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of like knife play going on, you know. Steven Seagal like doing a fucking knife dance before he tries to s- stab a guy, very alluring in its way. And like I notice, like there'll be shots where it's like so Seagal throws a punch, and then the shot cuts to Porter receiving the punch in the face, and. I feel I can tell that it's not Steven Seagal who's doing the punch. I think it's a stunt double. So that's yeah, unf- come on. That's unfortunate. Why? Why so cynical? <laughs> <laughs> Steven Seagal punched on that. <laughs> that's all you need to do. I mean, like, I don't want to go into like the you know like the fake Paul McCartney territory here, but the f- hair texture differs. <laughs> <laughs> I um, changed it up that day, you know. It's always <laughs> um, there, there, there is a part that I think is real funny, which is uh, you know, when the helicopter shows up with the fateful green screen cops, right? Yes. And Seagal sees that. I remember. Seagal sees that, and he's like, "Oh, I'm off!" And he runs and dives through a skylight, just fucking throws himself into it. <laughs> falls down there and uh yeah tell us about this green screen funny as fuck <laughs> yeah the, the the two the two agents donovan and franks they are there um you can just see like the uh ocean blur behind it's great yeah yeah like just very clearly green screened into this helicopter i i, I feel like they, they just, like, film them standing up, too. They're not, like, crouched in an attempt to look like they're in a helicopter. It's absolutely <laughs> stellar stuff. And, they and you know, Porter's the only guy on the roof now. And so they're like, hey, don't you move. And he moves. And then uh, Donovan's like, take him down. And then, you know, he, like, ah, I'm running away from the gunfire. Then it cuts to Steven Seagal who just took a big dive through a skylight and like he looks and he's got a shard of glass stabbed through his hand and he's like oh 
<laughs> and then like he just like pulls it out slowly no selling it or anything he just like tapes it up no problem um and he, he gets to work he's got some bombs to put down sets up some c fucking four on some pipes and stuff and you know then porter finds him again they both have taped fist which i guess means something thematically um and Seagal is like uh oh you, you your family hates you your country's abandoned you but i'm gonna kill you first and you know like porter doesn't have like some big line to come back he's like okay come on let's fight then <laughs> um <clears throat> more nice dancing going on this is where i uh I sort of made a comparison to myself of like this is a, a you know like if you watched say uh, Neil Mascaris versus Genichiro Tenyu from 1982 or something you know mm. like you can ed- you end up telling like okay man Steven Seagal he's not taking any bumps here he's not gonna let you get one over on him so I'll just enjoy <laughs> this fight on those terms with that in mind um, yes. yeah I have I have done here no Porter kicks no ass and really, I remember my initial watch of this. I was like, you know, I, I was I was a bit invested in Special Agent Porter as a character. I was like, come on, man, you got to kick his ass. Come on, do it. <laughs> but he didn't really. And then the helicopter swoops down into the window. And it's like, ah, oh, we're going to shoot you now. And Porter runs away as Seagal as his last action in this movie. He looks at a helicopter, flips open the detonator, and kabooies that shit and then comes outside the hotel where you know once again the fire engines the ambulances they're all here and they bring out this fucking like charred corpse <laughs> and like oh the dog tags found here were of Colonel Sykes and you know Carrie is there with her son and Peterson finds her it's like ah we found one body so that tells you that Porter you love so much, he was a bitch and murderer. Um, and Kerry is like, oh, the special agent Porter said me and my son. And Peterson, he like, he formulated this theory and now he's very insecure about it. So like, you don't believe me, do you? And, you know, she's like, uh, I'm going to leave now. And Peterson is left to be like, mm. Like he's got very pursed lips, you know. <laughs> and then like she goes to Carrie. She Carrie goes to Corey. Very similar names actually. Corey <laughs> is there. He has the baseball glove. And she's like, Where'd you get that? And he's like, Our friend gave it to us. <gasps> Porter? Where 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 was he from the what's this? Credits. <laughs> <laughs> and the credit music was good, right? <laughs> Yeah, credit music. That's that's my last note. Yeah, yeah. The credits they go pretty hard. Uh, special thanks includes, uh, among others, like uh, all those that rescue shelter animals, as well as the citizens of Utah that put up with us. Um, oh. And you know, then like tail comes up, and then the the last guitar like is like whoa, and the tail like swoops up in time <laughs> with it. This is pretty good. Um, thus finishing Code of Honor which um, you know I can't help but see the semblances of like a story here so something I thought uh, was like it'd be quite an artful way to like use Steven Seagal as like you know uh, knowing that like you know he's not gonna agree to like be like made vulnerable or this and that like having a story where like oh I, I'm a fucked up crazy guy from the army, and the last time I believed in anything was my superior officer who tried to get me on the right track, and now here I am. I am so angry at their morality. I'm gonna kill people, but I'm gonna imagine that it's my cool superior officer doing it instead. Like, <laughs> you know, there's like some semblance of a story there that could be again having some sort of like emotional depth to it. Instead, it's not that. It's just going out there, um, and then yeah, my my yeah. perception is that my when I show like a movie like this to my ADHD brain, it's just like, no, are you fucking kidding me? I'm not following this. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just write notes about like 
He's blown up a strip club. <laughs> funny CGI. <laughs> funny green screen. The end. <laughs> <laughs> so credit credit to you for following that movie like beat by beat. I watched it. I, I think I watched it like um the day after I watched Sniper Special Ops, and it's like a solid twenty five minutes longer than Sniper Special Ops. Yeah. Which is yeah. not a, a short movie in itself, but I felt every minute, and I, I was like, just trying to keep myself awake, just to write the bare minimum of notes. And then the next, you know, soon after it finished, I went to sleep. I woke up. Most of my memories were gone. That's just that's how, that's how my brain functions sometimes. You know, yeah. if, it, if it's if it's something that tries to. Um, like, like you say, if it, if it was a better edited movie, perhaps my brain would be like, okay, I, you know, this is my lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, but, uh... but as it was, it, it was some leftover chips that I didn't want. <laughs> 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 but what I will say is that if you, if you look up uh, this movie on Letterboxd, the top review will probably buy, be by... Uh, Beloved wrestling personality Logan Kenny. Ah yes. A friend yes. of a friend of yours from Scotland. Yes. Yes. Um and I, I'd like to disagree with him in his statement that Seagal needs to be stopped. <laughs> he 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 can't be stopped. These these types of like straight to DVD or whatever it is now, streaming services and that. These types of movies will never stop being made. But if you interject Seagal into them, they will become inherently more entertaining. Like, Seagal's pretty charming in this. You could tell he was kind of, like, fucking feeling himself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, he's like, yeah, I've got a pretty cool job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like... So many of these movies exist. The only reason that you watched it is because of Steven Seagal. So Steven Seagal must be the opposite of stopped, started, f- funded further. He 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 he's promoting cinema. That's what he's doing. He's promoting it with his presence. Exactly. Um. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, definitely. Um, the genre of like actual like B movies is being supplanted um and as much as one can attribute that to say circumstance of like you know time moving on the market moving on and stuff I think that like uh on a artistic level stuff such as that can still be reached and you know uh Code of Honor definitely one of the more forgettable examples of it but I'm glad it surrounds <laughs> yeah 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 and uh, Seagal is like an old reliable for that kind of pap. Yeah, yeah. You know what you're getting into. You want the Aikido. You want, like, the, you know... The weird the... accents, the the fact he doesn't know how to hold guns. <laughs> yeah, you, you want him wearing the, the wee bandana while he shoots people. <laughs> yes. When I'm sat down for, like, a good 65% of the movie. Fantastic. <laughs> Just probably to to all future directors thinking of hiring Steven Seagal for your B movie, do it, but keep it below hundred minutes, please. Fuck it out. Wow, wow. Like a ninety-minute runtime means less special effects to pay for, so it'll work out. Yeah, sure. Because <laughs> uh, the the other actors in this just they don't have presence they're annoying they're actively grating if anything it, it, it really does feel like sort of like uh, I remember reading something about it recently like you know like so, media that just appears fake like not fake as in it doesn't exist but instead like this is what they would put on like a TV inside a TV show you know like oh this is a fake movie that's on in this <laughs> story you know and yeah it does feel like that um which, yeah, I mean, like, uh, again, I, I sort of get fixated on, like, you know, like, how this movie could have worked. And really, the answer is, like, 
it would have needed a lot more money, and if there's a lot more money, then it probably wouldn't be made that it was made, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> the circumstances they'd have, would change. They'd, they'd have got someone else, someone Steven Seagal, to play the, the evil lead. Yeah, yeah. Um, as, it, as we are left with uh, the moral message that uh, in life, there are bad guys, and you should shoot the bad guys, because they're bad. And, hey... Maybe, 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 uh, the guy who shoots it is actually one guy instead of a guy and another guy. And whoosu, whoosu, whoosu. Do you like these flashbacks? Whoosu, whoosu. Moving over. Um. How? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, be, you know, based on our description, I just say like watch the entire Saw series because it's sort of like that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's Code of Honor. I would give it a tuna. A tuna <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> a tuna? A tuna. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say that. I went off one and a five. <laughs> well, I guess he'd say starner. Starner five. Because you can't really say one and a Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Starter. Yeah. Starner, starner five. Yeah, yeah. So that leads to an average rating of uh, two then. Because I'm two now and you're star now. So that leads to an average of two. Yeah. There we go. Wonderful. Our main event. Yes. Our main event. So obviously, you know, it's called fucking Code of Honor and that. <laughs> you, you know, like Ring of Honor and fucking Gabe <laughs> and the, the, the little rule book that he's got and the fucking handshakes. <laughs> it's fucking class, isn't it? <laughs> so, so we couldn't actually like we're not going to do like a fucking three hour ring of honor show on top of this that's too much so we did a 40 minute episode of ROH TV from 2012 obviously this is post Gabe ism but you know, Gabe's never really done any TV he, he does three, he does three and a half hour shows <laughs> but he's ex- exclusively tied to that Yes. I guess there was that like, there was that high imp was it high impact TV that he did in like two thousand and two, but that was just clips from the ROH DVDs that we've already covered. Oh yes, that. yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So, and I don't think you can even find those edits. So, that was out the window. We had to do this. We had to do Ring of Cornet. Yes, The Rock, starring Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, it's interesting seeing Ring of Honor in this period because, you know, uh, again, this is like a period of like, just like going to that The Burns area in Maryland and just like doing like four tapings at a time or what have you, you know, just like mass producing this TV content. You know, I remember when I got back into wrestling, it was 2009. And so by that point, obviously the game was gone. And the, it was, I, I suppose that this era of Ring of Honor, really, because uh, it, they were just like maybe a year away from like this logo that they had, you know, with the fucking like, uh, how would you describe the ROH logo in like 2012? It's like, it's got the swishy, that's, swishy that's the white, the white one with like the, the, yeah, the white text with the like, it's like Times New Romanish text. Yeah, like the, right. and like the O is like all swishy. It's got it's, it's like two brackets except you like made them kiss, <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and those brackets are Davy Richards and <laughs> Eddie Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and man, like I, I thought to myself, like even even though like Davy Richards and Eddie Edwards they show up in this episode as far as like a recap after the match from last week, but I yeah. felt I felt it was quite important still because. Uh, they were definitely the main two, in my mind, associated with Ring of Honor, contemporarily speaking, from when, like, uh, I would have been, like, following along, kind of, like, you know, very tangentially, you know, um, and, like, there is a part that I really felt a lot of sentimental value for, is where, uh, so that that's her Ring of Honor wrestling number 39, 
taped on 16th of June 2012, thank you, Strega, uh, aired on local <laughs> TV center. <laughs> Um, that's how this show opens up is with a recap of that uh, because they're fighting for the born contendership for the army title held by Kevin Steen and during this recap it shows this spot where David Richards he superplexes Eddie Edwards they crash down and then Dave Richards rolls up and does another move and I thought to myself man I remember one of their big mm-hmm. matches I believe it was in the Hammerstein Ballroom I may be wrong on that, but it was a match where he did a superplex, then rolled through, and then Eddie Edwards suplexed him out of the ring. And everyone flipped their shit at that. They were like, this looks so fake. I hate it. I hate you, Davey Richards. And now I'm like, that was a pretty funny move to do. And I'm glad I saw it here again. (laughs) Like, uh, the the legacy is inherent here. Um, what did you think of this, uh, like, what you saw here, this digest of Davy versus Eddie, the American Wolves? Well, you know, it, it would... I don't know what I'd do if I missed a spot from that match, you know? <laughs> it, it, is, it is kind of interesting that ROH sort of just became that. I guess there's, like, a... I guess uh, Tyler Black would be in developmental WWE. Oh, yes. By this point. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a very there's an in between period where he's like one of the main guys where I've seen absolutely nothing of it, and then somehow you get to Richards and Edwards having fun with the superplex. Good, yeah. good on them. The way this ends is that Jimmy Jacobs comes out and he interferes in the match, distracting Davy Richards, and Ed Edwards capitalizes, wins the number one contendership, but. Then it cuts to him afterwards. He's speaking in front of an ROH TV backdrop, and he's like, oh. I reviewed the footage, and that was an honourable win. So I am putting that down as a no contest, and I vacate the contendership. Yeah, he says he's gone to the officials to put it in the record books of a no contest. Absolutely. But you check You check Strigger. Oh, oh. He, he says Eddie Edwards wins. No. They didn't listen to Eddie. Fuck. That's bullshit. Uh, I, I'm sorry, it took me a light. Uh, I saw the <laughs> pinfall and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I recorded it as uh, Eddie Edwards Victorious. <laughs> if you have any problems with that, please uh, shoot my dish. <laughs> Did you say suck my dick? <laughs> suck my dickenhausen? <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, he spoke to the officials, but not the real officials. Yeah, kids, man. It's the biggest kids in the world. Um, <laughs> so, you know, he, he, like that, that, is the, that is the big angle to lead us in here. Eddie was saying, uh, I take back my victory. <laughs> it's the intro. Um, and, you know, I kind of feel here that Ring of Honor is like, without much in the way of a distinct identity. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mainly thought of that in the sort of main event. Mm. But it's it's pretty obvious throughout that it's kind of, um, you know, sort of controlled by someone who wants to take it a certain direction. But the crowds, the people behind the barricades, are very much expecting a, a different direction. It's a... It's an interesting thing. I've mainly seen like Ring of Delirious, where uh, you could uh. you could criticize the booking a lot of the time and how hot it felt as a product, but generally it felt like you know they were putting on something that the fans actually wanted to see. It didn't feel like a sort of clashing of ideals so much as this did. Yeah, yeah, like this. This feels sort of like. Uh... You know, our visuals don't really inspire much. Um, we don't have Gabe's Jungle playlist playing as musical accompaniment. <laughs> um, and it feels like sort of the unique things you could point to, like even just the Code of Honor, they're sort of tacked on. They're there, but, you know, it's, it's not the basis of promotion anymore. Um, 
and yeah, it just generally feels sort of like uh, not hot at all. It's there, you know. Yeah. I, I, people are reacting, I suppose, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, we must go forth with, uh, yes, the De Burns Arena in Baltimore, Maryland, with our commentary team of Kevin Kelly and Nigel McGuinness. Collision is here, Eva. <laughs> Colliders represent. That's right. That's right. Um, I uh, hated Kevin Kelly here, uh, just as ever. One yeah. of the worst commentators to ever exist. Yeah. I like Nigel though. Nigel is good here. Yeah. I have, uh, I, I've got a clip from him that I'll play in a bit. Um, but. Yes, we, 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 we go off here. What is the what's the first match that we see, Eva? What's going on? It is it is Mike Bennett with Maria Canellis and Bob Evans versus Adam Page with nobody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe you just knew the lineup beforehand, but like it took me like uh, a second or two to realize like, oh wait, that's Adam Page from AEW. Yeah, I did look at the the card beforehand to help pick the episode. Like, I knew everybody on this card, so I was like, okay, I'll do that one then. <laughs> and I think this is actually his ROH debut. It's probably, I don't know who would have seen him before this point. He is uh, very attached to, like, a green cap that he has. Yes. He re- he really likes that. It's in his promo photo and he comes out with it for his entrance. That's right, that's right. And, as and then he's as got it... a sort of like curled curled mullet as his hairstyle that he's rocking. Oh yeah, he's, he's like all like dreamy and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, as far as like his tenure, this is his first on-air Ring of Honor match because uh, he was in the dark match, one of the dark matches of RH Champions vs. All-Stars. 2011 from Richmond, Virginia. Ooh. So you know. What did he do? What did he do in that? Oh. He and Cedric Alexander lost to Bobby Shields and Orion Bishop. Well, that, that's unfortunate. So you know if uh, Cedric still Bobby in the line, Shields and Orion Bishop. Bobby Shields and Orion. Like the oh. constellation. It feels like they they picked a the wrong winner there. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of those guys. Um, well, you know, Cedric Alexander has not worked in a week, so that should be good enough for him to just like jump to AEW right now and be like, Hangman Page, you fucked that match up for us way back then. I'm going to kill you now. Yes. Now that is long term storytelling. <laughs> Tony owns a tape library. He surely has the dark matches as well. Yes. Yeah. Do it, Tony. Do it, Tony. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this was his first on-air uh, appearance in Ring of Honor. It's for Adam Page. Um, and yes, they, they, they talk about him being like, you know, a young up-and-comer who is really on the up-and-up in Ring of Honor. And let's go to the tape where, you know, uh, they list height, weight, uh, I think age as well. Um, yeah, and then also probably birthplace. Yes, birthplace as well. Where they're finding it off, and code of honor. Yes, no, or in Mike Bennett's case, <gasps> maybe. <laughs> I Quest, don't know. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you be? What's like... a handshake? <laughs> <laughs> The, the original Ring of Honor was built on people who liked shaking hands, and then there was Christopher Daniels who despised shaking hands. Yes. And then Michael Bennett, he's come from an area of America where he's like, what is a handshake? I, I'm i not familiar with this tradition. Ugh. I mean, like, why would you even be in Ring of Honor if you don't like handshakes? Like, by this point... The wrestling scene has expanded. You could go to, like, I don't know, PWG or uh, 
PCW or LOW or any number of promotions we've even mentioned in this podcast, and you could fucking do your wrestling there. If you don't like handshakes, then just don't come to Ring of Honor. It's that easy, I think. I would I would agree. Well, Adam anyway. Page, he, he says yes. Yes, handshake. Yes, handshake for Adam Page. This is why he's the future. Exactly. And so uh, there is somewhat of a code of honor, but uh, Nigel is like, that was hardly a code of honor, was it? It's <laughs> so, uh, pretty good. Then uh, they get going here. Hangman Adam Page, he is lighting the Mike Bennett up. Do you like Mike Bennett? Do you like the prodigy Mike Bennett? Uh, I've never really formed like a strong opinion on him or the kingdom. I think him and the kingdom hanging out with Roddy for the last few months has been pretty good. Pretty yeah. good pretty good trio there. But obviously the sort of the weight of the uh Adam Cole Bebe AEW Devil Wardlow is also there for some reason. It's, it's kind of uh, halted the uh, the good stuff a little bit, but you know they could do something. They're, they're all right as like chuckle fuck guys, him and Taven. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I think uh, that whole devil stable is following the sort of natural arc for stuff, where like you know you have this big turn, and like they're initially all like serious guys, but you know. They're all kind of goofy. They end up just being goofy, like in like a month or so, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's the that's the arc that they're going on. Uh, I myself think he's okay. I I I don't. Do you remember, remember his uh, WWE run of the like? Oh epic yeah, Rock Rock theme. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I remember. Yeah, he, he, he defeated Sami Zayn, and then Sami Zayn defeated him, and then he defeated <laughs> Sami Zayn, and then Sami Zayn defeated him. And Fuck I, yeah, man. I don't know what else happened there. Evenly uh, matched. Please. <laughs> I, think so, I think someone porked his wife during that period. There was like a period where he was meant to go to rehab or something, and he didn't. So Vince was like, right, I'm going to have someone make out with Maria on TV, that would show you why he gets paid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would show you for your bank balance going up on my expense. <laughs> Good grief. Who well, was that? It wasn't it wasn't Lashley, that was Rooster. Unless Lashley was just on a fucking tear. <laughs> I Do you mean, remember who it was? Let's see. Uh Mike Bennett, your career at WWE. Um I honestly wouldn't be surprised if it was Lashley. Yeah, he was eliminated by Mark Henry and Royal Rumble, and then made his debut for 205 Live. Um, 205 Live. Ryan Satin reports that they wanted their release. Um, uh, um, yeah, it does not see here whether someone uh, like porked Maria, to use your wording. Um <laughs> Like it so, does, someone it, did. It does, Maybe it not does, a fork and... It does say like uh, they they appeared on Raw after Maria was like pregnant, and they would do this thing where she berates him for being a bitch of a husband. It says this is not your baby. This is you are not the father, um, and stuff. Uh, so, so she was she was just like splitting up with him basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the... Yeah, I think I got it confused with like the the Rusev Lana Lashley triangle thing. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, you know, a similar level of like, oh, you've done something that we don't like, so we're gonna cuckold you now. Um, which you know, it's just like, yeah, it it, it, it is another uh, gaze into the deeply disturbed sexual psychosis of Vince McMahon. But luckily, right now, here in 2012, Mick Bennett's all right. You know, he, <laughs> he's here in Ring of Honor. He's still got his hair. You know, he's, he's a prodigy. You know, it's going good for him. And he cuts off babyface Adam Page's offense 
because Adam Page is going for a tornado DDT, and Maria Canellas, she is like, hey, 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 look over here. And while Adam Page is distracted, Mick, I, I, God, I keep thinking to call him Mick Canellas, but that's his freaking WWE name, Mike Bennett. He dropped his ass. fucking fed sleeve name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Drop kicks Adam Page, gets him tied up in the top buckle. They're like, oh, he could tear his ligaments that way. And then uh, he does a Russian leg sweep into the barricade. During this, they say that Eddie Edwards is on his uh, his Die Hard Rules run, where like he's like you know he's got to like prove himself against former Ring of Honor champions to get himself back to that belt. And who is next on this list? But Homicide! So I heard that and was like, ah, oh, this is like a cool match. Um, that is for Best in the World in New York. Their next Pepavu. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, there's one note that I got. I liked how sort of unfamiliar and fresh Adam Page was to this audience because the ring announcer Bobby Cruz he has to look at he has to look down at his bit of paper ah. to be like from uh Aaron's Creek, Virginia. Yes. Yes. He has to, he has to remind him that it's not ingrained into him. Aye, aye. Because it's that, like who the fuck is this guy? Ah, that's quite quite a, a nice wee detail. I say details if yeah. it's like intentional, it might not be, but even still it has that wee thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a truly green guy. Hey, just the trunks, baby. Um, so they get back in and, you know, Mick Bennett's doing a rest hold. The crowd chants, you can't wrestle at him. And Kevin Kelly is like, I think they know he can wrestle. Well, why the fuck they chant, you can't wrestle it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you don't hear that chant that much nowadays, I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't. I hadn't really thought about it, but yeah. I'll tell you someone who cannot wrestle for realsies is Brutal Bob Evans, the second manager oh. of Mike Bennett. He, uh, the, the story, is, as far as I could piece it together, is that he was unable to get into Ring of Honor to become a professional wrestler. And so, you know, it, uh, it's led to being a very angry individual, a very resentful individual. And this line here, I'm about to play it by Nigel McGuinness, uh, shows Nigel's thoughts on why this could be. And Bob screaming on the outside now. Certainly got an axe to grind. I don't think anybody can deny that. Maybe he wasn't loved as a kid. Someone told me his birth certificate was an apology letter from the condom factory. <laughs> and I, I love the little, like, he has a state through it. He's like, someone told me, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Condom factory. Yeah. The condom yeah. factory. Yeah. Condom factory. I noticed that his, his voice is like, obviously he was a fully grown adult by this point, but his voice sounds so much higher than it does today. Right. So that, yeah, yeah. This is, this is like his fucking Jello Biafra years. <laughs> his what years? His Jello Biafra years. <laughs> the dead Kennedys. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Kill, 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 kill the boy. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. The condom factory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, you know, this little quip from Nigel is enough to wake Adam Page up, I think, because he begins a babyface comeback. It's interesting how they play up in this match, how Mick Bennett's place in Ring of Honor, because... Kevin Kelly's like, this would be such a fucking upset if Adam Pace beat him. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's like uh, some near falls here. Uh, but eventually it comes down to Adam Pace does a roll up, gets kicked out of, and then a TKO from Mike Bennett, that prodigy, gets that three. And, you know, all is well for the prodigy and all is so sad for Adam Page. Uh, but it's not over there. Because they decide to beat him up some more. Brutal Bob Evans, he does this weird thing where he like gets him in a sidewalk slam position and then just like drops him. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <Whoops. laughs> um and then uh, Maria is going to go for the woman special slap. 
But then <laughs> Eddie Edwards runs out to save Adam Page. Mike Bennett grabs Mike, says, Hey, idiot, how about you stop sticking your nose in my business? And <clears throat> he says, Eddie Edwards, why don't you challenge Brutal Bob Evans next week? And then Eddie, in his, like, uh, and, you know, his big boy voice goes, Did you really just challenge me? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, he goes into this whole thing of, like, Oh, get Bob out of the nursing home. Make sure he takes his pills. Give him an early dinner. I'll, I'll gladly beat his ass. Die hard style. So. Oh, yeah. Do you feel excited for this got, match? This is the, um, the brutal, brutal ball? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we come now to what I felt was is about... a promo package. No way, promo. I know. Um, oh yeah, promo. It's probably one of the more listless parts of this program is Kevin Steen, Jimmy Jacobs, and Stephen Carino coming out to blab 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 about James Cornette and stuff. Um, now, I personally remember Kevin Steen being one of the other people who I associated with Ring of Honor because I remember that's around the time of, like, say, him breaking up with El Generico and having that whole year-long feud. Uh, everyone on Wu loved his ass. They loved, the, like, you know, him having, like, that epic satanic theme song or whatever. And so, mm. like, you know, it was a peak of storytelling, all this stuff. And that goodwill, I feel, carried over to this, where he... Um, the exact details escape me, but I believe he was like, uh, it was up in the air when he was going to be a Ring of Honor. And part of that was, you know, like the sort of tensions between him and Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette thinking that he is a bitch who cannot wrestle good and all that. Um, and then that became sort of the storyline, you know. It seems like yeah. they, they fell into a bit of an unfortunate habit because I remember, you know, Summer of Punk, that that gets pulled off, works out. This whole thing of, oh, I could go to that fed, and ha-ha, and everyone loves it. And then I remember a similar thing being done with Tyler Black, too, where he wins it as a triumphant babyface, but he's leaving soon. So, ah, now I am son of a bitch who will go to that fed. And then suddenly here, it, it all just has to do with sort of like, the politics of the backstage or oh, you try to hold me down cornet because I am fat <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> and like I don't think it comes off good um, what about you yeah, the, other, the yeah. other thing I really noted is that um, I remember I was playing uh, Minesweeper while this played in another window I was like well I don't need to look at this with my eyes so I can just <laughs> that's ADHD for you but, um... right sure sure but um, yeah, the the gist of it is that Cornette has tried to ban the package bar driver, and yep. Cornette's the baby face, so it's supposed to be like, oh hell yeah, I don't want to see them head drops. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's about what I got really, you know. The thing that I took away from this is that during this promo, Kevin Steen talks about how, uh, oh you know, Cornette, you've tried to break me down by putting me in no DQ matches and street fights but you think this will soften me up you are wrong and hey because of this Davy Richards I propose we make it a no DQ match when we fight and it's like oh my God. You, 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 you just described how you've just been working no DQ matches <laughs> <laughs> why don't we do a match exactly like the other ones ah! um, and then like he tells Jim Cornette he leaves with this he says you're going to realise this isn't about who's the best in the world this is a horse's crisis pal that's my Kevin Steen voice um, <laughs> and <laughs> I thought it was Cardiolo <laughs> Canadian Cardiolo um <laughs> Yeah, as in, this is a similar thing to, like, say, 
basis of its theory where what's at stake is the company, control of the company. But it's like, man, there's like 150 people here. What is to be controlled? You know? <laughs> it all feels like very like meaningless to like uh, have like, oh, I've got, I'm holding this thing hostage. Uh, these 150 people aren't going to see Adam Page matches like you want to, Tim Cornette. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, quite listless. I mean, like, what, what what are your feelings on Kevin Steen? Like, how, how much of him had you seen before he came to Dafed, really? My introduction was from him was NXT. I completely right, right. missed the indie, the era of indies where he was, where he was the guy. So, yeah, I I found him out from him. Actually, probably wasn't even NXT. It was probably when he came out for the um, John Cena's US Open Challenge. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, my general opinion of him is that he's he's quite good. He's had quite a lot of good WWE matches. I've only seen like five of his matches before WWE. He's quite good. He's done he's done well to still be there. And when his music hits, the crowd they cheer or they go boo, whatever the appropriate reaction is, they do it. He's done quite well for himself. Yes, yes. But this run, I have very little to say because I have very little frame of reference for it. It's a successful pro wrestler. Unfortunately, even still, on his tombstone, will be etched the words, was the avatar of humble wrestling. <laughs> humble wrestling. Now we move to another match. It's the Briscoes. Day is back. The Briscoes have been here the whole Yay. freaking time, holding it down in Ring of Honor, the heart of the place, and yeah. they are facing the 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 hot new duo of QT Marshall and Dexter Loomis. <laughs> yeah, well, the, he was known he was known at this time as Sam Shaw. What? No, that's not true. Oh, okay, then I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's a that's a tag team, Sam Shaw and QT Marshall. Yeah, yeah. This is even before he uh, does the uh, proto Dexter Loomis character in TNA, so he's just a normal guy. It's weird. Yeah, just just dude called Sam or Dexter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They say that uh, there was an ether like substance used against Mark Briscoe by. The world's greatest tag team, or I think it's actually wrestling greatest tag team in Ring of Honor. They they change it for some reason. Um, uh, Nigel says, uh, "Charlie Haas, he's having a giraffe." <laughs> what? <laughs> he said, it. "Oh yes, you, you, you having a giraffe? Yeah, yeah, I get that." He's he's having a giraffe. <laughs> Well, they're, they're... Yeah, we we did consider doing the episode with uh, Briscoe's as the world's greatest tag team, but I think we settled on this one because the rest of the card looked more intriguing. Yes, yes. Um, but if, if we ever do, if we ever feel the need to cover another twenty twelve episode of Ring of Honor, I know we're the one. <laughs> it's gonna be that do. one. <laughs> God, if you think it's another one, you're having to too <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, the wrestling's greatest tag team, they're giraffing to the bank because the Briscoes, that last time they faced WGTT uh, and that easter like substance was used, that was their last chance. So they got no more chances to get at the Irish tag titles. It's quite unfortunate for them, but luckily, uh, Mark Briscoe has an incredible goatee, goal, doesn't he? He's got that. Yeah, he's got like the, the, the long moustache thing going on, but with the the stubble of the goatee underneath it. Yeah, yeah. Code of Honor observed here. Both teams are yes. They are both yes. Uh, which is great. Thank fuck for that. Um, Nigel says that Mark's been training his neck and it's that neck that protects your brain. <laughs> I think it's the skull, but <laughs> if he says it's the neck, it's the neck. Yes, 
then here comes Truth Martini. Eva, here he comes. Eva, what do you think of Truth Martini? So I've only seen his uh, run with the House of Truth, which was him and Jay Lethal and Donovan Dijak and fucking... <laughs> What's the fucking other guy? Jo- uh, Joey Daddy Eagle. And uh, uh, did you mention Roderick Strong? Roderick Strong? Yeah. He said it. He said it on this episode. Oh, yeah. he He's he's in this group. He wasn't in House of Truth, though, in 2015. Oh, okay. Right, right. Something happens between now and then. Okay, I see. Many things happened. Do you like him? Do you like his presence? Um, it... It always felt a bit weird because Jay Lethal can talk. So why is this guy around? And his, his gimmick was he had the Book of Truth. And he would pass it to Jay Lethal. And Jay Lethal would hit him with this hard... Obviously it was a hard cover book. If it was a paperback, then... Yes, yes. It would be pitiful. You would you would not even get a two count. <laughs> but if it's a hardback then you can officially win a wrestling match that way at the Tokyo Dome. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep, absolutely. Uh, that's the main thing I associate with him, is uh, mediocrity. Uh, like, <laughs> very mediocre, G-lethal R-O-H title defences in Shinihon Progress. Um, yeah, and I which... quite like J-lethal, but he just didn't add anything to the act. If he was with, like, if he was just with Dijak, could maybe see the purpose of it, but uh. yeah, yeah. Uh, comes here because he has laid down the challenge to the Briscoe brothers, which apparently they have not responded to. So he comes in and fucking like, uh, uh it's dire the banter between Truth Martini and <laughs> Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly's trying to give him the third degree, like, uh, Oh, what 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 is this and that? And Triff is like, oh, I would tell you, Kevin Kelly. And it's like, fuck, sh- shut up, man. Hey, this. <laughs> Why'd you put the headset on, man? <laughs> Meanwhile, in the ring, Mark does a crab walk sent on off the second rope, which is pretty good. Uh, this is a squash match, uh, but Dexter and QT, they like do some dirty teamwork to get some comebacks in. It's, it's interesting because, like, uh, uh, the Briscoes on the t-shirt have man up on it and indeed when uh, Mark is playing the BIP the Briscoe in peril uh, the crowd they begin chanting man up man up so you know an overact mm. an overact everyone loves them the Briscoes QT is working over Jay he steps on him makes him angry and then that leads to a very nice hot tag where Jay he just like punches both of them for a while and then like just leaps over to his brother Mark who then begins redneck kung fu and then a John Woo. Um I really like the 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 team uh the teamwork of like Jay does a huge fucking choke slam and then Mark does that froggy mm. bow off the top. Very nice. Uh I believe it gets broken up and then goes into a big doomsday device for the win on Dexter Loomis while QT is out on the mat. As the pin is being counted, uh, Truth Martini goes, Briscoe Brothers, I hate you. I <laughs> I don't like him. I think he's an Eve-head gimmick, Eva. He's, he, he just stinks. Um, and <laughs> then he, he gets on the mic, he's like, Briscoe Brothers! Over here, you have not accepted my challenge. Are you two men, or are you what you farm? A bunch of chickens. And Jeepers goes, Jeepers goes like, we don't give a damn who you bring out. We accept your challenge for New York. So it's the Briscoes versus Truth Martini's mysterious Guardians of Truth. Now, Eva, Mm -hmm. can you guess who the Guardians of Truth are? Hmm. Would it be Mosh and Fresher the Headbangers? God damn it, you looked it up. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Headbangers, they're, they they come to Ring of Honor and they lose to the Briscoes in like as much time as this took, so what the fuck? <laughs> what, a, 
when he was cooking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we've got the build for that match now. And we got to go to Vera Scott with the embassy. Do you know anything of this R.D. Evans fella? Uh, no, he has... He's just a name that I read a bunch of times. I... Is this when it... No, this is not the promo package for Best in the World, is it? Is this... No, this is, a, this is a, a very short interview with the Embassy, uh, where, like, R. Who, R. who consists of the Embassy? Is that a Prince Nana thing? Yeah, Prince Nana's a leader, but R. D. Evans is, like, he's portrayed as somewhat of, like, a businessman who, like, the Embassy's partnered up with, and so, like... Uh, Prince Nana is going to say something about something and uh, R.D. Evans is just like my client will not speak at this time you know that <laughs> sort of thing um, but I remember him as a Chakara guy because he was Archibald Peck <laughs> mm. he, was, he was Archibald I love when my rest called Archibald his character was cool. His character was he was like a band guy so he would wear the big tall hat and like have a marching drum it was really epic you know well like a like a marching band yeah wow that's a that's a gimmick it was really funny ha 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 that's what i said back in the day when i saw archibald <laughs> pick um i also remember him as to tie things back i remember when ryback turned heel and became a bully. He bullied Artie Evans on SmackDown, I think. Wow. Yeah. But as I said, to get bullied by Ryback. Ryback rules. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, stuff going on with the embassy here. And now we go to this uh, best in the world package. Kevin Kelly. In front of a green screen. Running down yeah, so if it, his car. If you find... If you thought Briscoe's This is the Headbangers was a weird booking, Michael Elgin This is Fit Finley. Yeah. Oh, the tops, yeah. What were what they cooking? Do you do you like Finley's promo? <laughs> I don't really remember it now. He, he, it goes, to, it cuts to Finley, who is like, oh, you know, like, you, 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 you say you're unbreakable, Michael Elgin, well, we're going to find out about that. We're going to find out who you are. <laughs> like, Oh shit! Did you tell <laughs> Finley who Michael Logan was before this? <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, there's also uh, ANX, the All Night Express versus the wrestling's greatest tag team. They show the big angle where uh, uh, All Night Express, uh, Kenny King, and Rhett Titus they like got a pin on wrestling's greatest tag team, but like you know, it's one of the ones where like. You know, like Rhett Titus counted the pin, you know? Uh, but it's <laughs> like, ah, oh, we could do that maybe in an official match. So, you know, there you go with that. I, I noticed uh, myself that uh, maybe not necessarily Charlie Haas, but Shelton Benjamin really feels like a star above everyone else here. Even just in like the seconds I see of him, it's like, whoa, what's this guy doing here, you know? Yeah, that, that was the main reason I was intrigued to see them versus the Briscoes. I'd be like, hmm. These two things should not be together, but they are. Yes, yes. Spring cleaning has necessitated it. So there's that. And there's also the Die Hard Challenge, uh, mentioned before, of Eddie Edwards versus Homicide. And then there's also um, Adam Cole versus Kyle O'Reilly. Uh, now, my chronology uh, may not be up to snuff, but I remember there being a Cole versus O'Reilly match that was like really well regarded. I don't know if you remember it. It's, it's one where like Cole gets his like nose busted up, and like there's this moment where he goes like ah, and like when he like blows out, like his fucking blood gets mixed in it, so he like spits out this blood mist, and everyone thought <laughs> just like this big coming out party for like the both of them really. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the match in 2012, but in any case, it is booked, um, and then. They say also that Mike Bennett and Maria Cadellis will be there. So that'll be great. You can buy yes. tickets. That. Um, and then also for the TV championship, Jay Lethal, Tommaso Ciampa, and Roderick Strong. 
Jay Lethal says words on this. He says, oh, these other two guys, they don't like me. But that's fine. They don't like each other. Get in the rain, see. And other such things like that. Um, Wrestling. And... <laughs> Personal disputes resolve within the ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that That's basically what he says. And finally, the main events, Kevin Steen versus David Richards. It's the last chance, they say. And, you know, Kevin Kelly alludes to next week's main event, which is a prelude match. It will be Kevin Steen and Jimmy Jacobs versus Team Ambition. David Richards and Kyle O'Reilly. They then go to Kevin, uh, Kyle O'Reilly and David Richards in the back. Um, Davy, he is thinking about revenge. He also says, Kyle, look at me, I'm talking to you. You become a whiner. It stops now. <laughs> and Kyle's like, okay. And I think to myself, wow, this this resembles the acting that you see in homosexual pornography. <laughs> so, yeah. What, what, what did you think of Davy Richards off this one promo? Did he, did he come off as the guy to you? No. I wrote, <laughs> Bryce T sucks. Why is he talking? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. So I think it's important to like differentiate. Like back in the day, you could probably group Davy and Eddie together, and then oh. they teamed, and there was even more grouped together. But since then, Eddie Edwards has he had a jorts era where he had brawls with Tommy Dreamer in Impact, and he did stuff with Noah as well. He's uh, much superior to Davy Richards. He's done, he's done a lot to. At the very <laughs> least, like, set himself apart. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And it's good, because, like, I think as well about her, like, uh, you know, Kayla really could probably could be kind of guys like that, too. Uh, you know, even just by, like, being teamed together with him. And since then, I feel mm. like he really has eclipsed uh, Davey as well. I think a lot of it is just that, like, you know, Davey Richard basically, like, you know, I cannot recall the exact details, but he's not been working in, like, big places. He's not been working prominently, consistently. I mean, all these guys, they've... Uh, he's made, like, two or three comebacks. But, uh... Yeah, yeah. And but it's... Some, something happens every time. Like, I, I don't follow it closely, so... Yeah, yeah. And, like, uh, <clears throat> it's good that the the others not having those issues are able to get into places where they can be like, hey, this is me. You know me, not... Davy Richards, I'm not he or Del Davy Richards. Don't call me that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and then we get uh, vignettes before this TV tell main event because oh, you know, they've done the freeway, but also Champa's coming for Roderick Strong right now. So they play a Champa vignette. Um, this guy looks yeah. st- stupid. Funny, funny <laughs> idea to have a vignette. Just before a guy has a match, he's like, here he is. <laughs> but yeah, you said he looks stupid? Yeah, very stupid, I think. He, he's bleached his stubble, right? I hate the bleached stubble. He looks he looks older than he does now, thanks to that. He looks crispy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he looks like he's like a load of biscuits and crackers <laughs> and he's got all crumbs on his face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you eat a lot of uh, crackers when you're the dominant male, which is his nickname. <laughs> they, they like, yeah. they intersperse shots of him with, like, shots of a lion. He's ROH as equivalent of a lion. Um, so, you know, there's that. The main event, the World Television Championship. Yes. Roderick Strong defending, accompanied by Truth Martini, taking on Tommaso Ciampa with Mia Yim. Prince Nana and Audi Evans. Yes, a whole laundry and list Champa, of managers. Champa's just been going to town on those fucking Jacob's crackers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really quite something. Um, Rod- Roderick's video package literally just like him saying he's the best in the world and then like a super cut off his sick kick, which, uh, you know, is really nothing compared to being called a lion. Uh, I don't think that's how you should bark at a champion as uh, not being a lion, really. Uh, but, you know, here we are now. 
Roderick uh, not too keen about this match, uh, but it's happening, and Champa's here. So did you have did you have any expectations for this match main eventing? No. No. I kind I kind of did. I thought I might see a Freena here. <laughs> this could be a Freena. Yeah, yeah. I but mean, but it was it was not Freena. It was not Freena. I mean, I remember uh, watching the Cruiserweight Classic, featuring Gargano versus Ciampa, and thinking, mm. oh, that's pretty cool." And then I'm sure I remember watching like, no, I would have watched the uh, the revival against American Alpha. I think I never watched uh, the revival against DIY, so I didn't see like the big famous matches. But honestly, yeah. my sort of recollection of Tommaso Ciampa is just sort of like uh, thinking, oh, I don't know about this character. And that wasn't helped here because his character arc right now is he recently lost. His undefeated streak is broken. So now he's crazy. He like, uh, it's just... Uh, yeah, so I'd seen, one, I'd seen one, I'd seen one pre-WWE Champa match, I think. It was him in like a, it was like a scramble or something. Mm. And he brought like, he brought like a decent level of intensity to make it more memorable than it might have otherwise been. You know, moving all fast and that big fast mm. uppercut. Maybe he did like a boost scrape or something. I don't know. Yeah, I thought, yeah, he's pretty good. Never really bought that pace in this match, even though Roddy's like, Roddy's someone who also, he can, he could run fast and... Yeah, and hit nice impactful moves, and you thought you think maybe eh, maybe these two, maybe Frida. That's no. But if it, this is where it feels like the Cornet influence is to most to the detriment of the promotion. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I'd say because so. it feels like they're very much holding a lot back, even though it's the TV main event, and you want people to buy the pay per view, right? Yeah, yeah. You should go crazy. Like, you know, imagine if they do a big match and they're like, oh boy, imagine this match if Jay Lethal's also in it. Buy a pay-per-view now to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the corrupting influences that are throughout Ring of Honor right now can really be felt in this match too because, pull up the tail of the tape, both of them are no. No Code of Honor. No. Kevin Kelly says, don't expect a code of honor. And when I wrote it down, I, I pointed an arrow to it and said, what the fuck? WTF? It just doesn't work. Like, come on. Even in the Christopher Daniels era, like, you could say that worked because somebody would extend their hand and be like, hey, Christopher Daniels, this is my hand. Would you like to shake it? <laughs> and Christopher Daniels would be like, absolutely not. I would not shake your hand. And the person who extended the hand would be like, oh, well, I'm really angry now, so... Yeah, could, yeah. I'm going to fight you with even more... It was two guys who were like, no. I <laughs> 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 uh, just, no. <laughs> then, I don't know, you're not getting much out of that. I think the referee should have full rights to, like, if he sees the cha- a champion, a champion, refusing handshake, just give it a belt now. Give it a belt now. You I, don't got it anymore. I like the... I like the formality which the, the the code of honor has been afforded at this point. Like, you know, we, you apply to be a wrestler at Ring of Honor, and you got to tick the box that says yes or no to yeah. handshakes. Yeah. Rather, rather than just you know doing it or not doing it in the moment, it's like I I have officially put myself in the no code <laughs> of honor section. Yeah, yeah, like uh, crazy. A, 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 a member of staff had to go around the locker and be like uh, do a survey <laughs> yeah so now uh, Champa as I said he's a, he's a very crazy guy right now he's he's off kilter due to his loss he like does like weird telekinesis stuff with his hands and says give me my title um, and you know uh, he's beating up Roddy he's pickling I wrote down he is going <laughs> pickle Rick mode and Nigel L- love it when he is commenting such a match because he says Champer <laughs> it's, it's Tommaso Champer in there um, Tommaso Champa and you see here that uh, you know there is a there is a, a tribute to a legend in classic Ring of Honor as we saw with Eddie Guerrero 
Similarly, best in the world to go to honor Bruno San Martino. Oh my god. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so now after that they go to their last ad break. So you know you come back from this and you're gonna see uh the result of this T V title match. They point out Mia Yim in the corner of the embassy. There's a weird thing where like Kevin Kelly says, uh, you know, uh beforehand Mia was just a play toy of Nana, but since Artie Evans came in, she's now a manager. Like, what? <laughs> Artie Evans is like hey, you see that play toy that you've got there? <laughs> that could be a fully fledged manager. You need to stop having sex with her and apply for a manager's license right now. <laughs> so, aside from that, uh, Chapa does his thing where he brings down his knee pad, but then he misses with the knee. And then, a whole bunch of moves going down, uh, he hits an air raid crash, and Nigel gives it treatment where, like, you know, it's like, oh, I didn't get all of it. And, I don't know, it seems <laughs> on point. But then, you know, kicks out, and... Uh, like Kevin Kelly's like, that's a great point, Nigel, because he kicked out and thus it wasn't full strength. And, you know, I have kind of tired of commentary being appraised in this way, where, like, uh, it feels like there's, like, almost like a bit of a, like a checklist to check off. Like, you know, like, uh, I, th- I think this is how Kevin Kelly has been allowed to prosper, because he will, like, uh, you know, he'll be like, oh, He's favoring the arm still, and so could not do the move. And it was like, mm, yes, very good commentary. <laughs> Don't like it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're going on doing a bunch of moves. Uh, I think, as well as the actual content itself, like there was a bit of, uh, you know, to use the word again, listlessness to it. There wasn't all that much heat for it either from the crowd or from like how the rest was moving i feel like um yeah the, i mean the pace is like one thing but it's also another it's a heel versus heel match and you kind of have to those can be good but you kind of have to ham it up a bit i feel yeah so it emphasizes this, oh this is two bastards trying yeah. to one up each other with their cheating but instead it's just yeah, just, yeah. Just doing moves, but pulling faces. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's not really great. And then the finish comes when Prince Nana gets on the apron and Roderick Strong he gives him a bop, punches him in the face, and then Champa he hits his finisher. But by this time, Prince Nana is so angry can't believe that Roderick Strong punched him in face. So he gets in and starts beating up Roderick Strong. And the referee is like, oh my god, DQ! And that's it. And Kevin Kelly is immediately like, Prince <laughs> Nana, you are so stupid. You are a stupid motherfucker. You just cost your man the title. He was about to get it fair and square. And Champa Simley is like, he is making the faces. He is putting his hands up to his head. Oh no. Why am I so insane? <laughs> and <laughs> the implication, because, you know, before the match, Roderick Strong was like, Truth Martini, why am I in this match? And Truth is like, uh, hey, Roddy, the X fate is in the, you know, so like he's got a plan here. And then before the match starts, there's no code of honor between the two guys, but Artie Evans, Chris Nana, and Truth Martini, they all had shake. So what's going on here? Maybe the House of Truth and the Embassy are in collusion together. And maybe no. that was on purpose that Prince Nana disrupted Champa's no. chances because they're going to turn on Tommaso Champa. No, yeah, come on. This is too cynical. This is like <laughs> when you said Steven Seagal wasn't throwing those punches. <laughs> well... We are less of these questions. I don't actually know whether that occurs. I'm just guessing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Roderick Strong ends this show with uh, his TV title 
retained uh, unscrupulously, you know, like just dishonorably, really. But fine, he's a dishonorable guy, and so is Champa. But uh, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I I think just like with the Yen show, the show really farts out of here, like yeah, there was no reaction to the finish. There wasn't much reaction to much most of the match. It's just, it's just dude watching stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wrestling it happened. <laughs> And then from there, like, uh, it would be a couple of years before, uh, you know, Colonel William Sykes would come back from the war to show a bunch of people and bring our race <laughs> where it needs to be. Fuck yeah. OGP. OGP. <laughs> Tune in next week for Eddie Edwards. This is Brutal Bob. <laughs> oh, <All right>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Davey Richardson, Kyle O'Reilly, Kevin Steen and Jimmy Jacobs. I won't be watching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've, we've covered a whole lot here, a, a lot of the landscape. We've covered uh, five <laughs> movies. Five movies. That's an entire thing of Ebert and Siskel right there, I think. And we've yeah. covered it. Um, and we also got, like, uh, you know, three uh, Freddy Valentine matches and one mm -hmm. RVD match. And four right back four matches right back. all watched by you and i just have to sit here like oh that's good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um and yeah then code of honor then and then Army i mean wrestling. the actual code of honor was basically just the inverse of that was, mm, interesting <laughs> yeah yeah it's true um so yeah oh, my, i got one final note here it says putin oh. guy <laughs> i think that's that's a very incomplete note, but I think it's because Steven Seagal is mates with Vladimir Putin. You see, that's my first thought, but then I wonder, like, maybe did you see someone who looks like Vladimir Putin? I don't, I don't think there was a Vladimir Putin lookalike on Ring of Honor. <laughs> Just wanted to, you know, <laughs> you could, you, you can Google it and see that there's a. Uh, picture with steven seagal and vladimir putin and their matey oh yeah they're besties they're besties absolutely i bet vladimir putin thought a lot of code of honor he was like there's my bestie there's my yeah. bestie like the young thug song yes this was uh good <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh so you know we've been all over the place in this episode of official grappley podcast really this is something that's been years in the making we, yeah, I, I remember still. We meant this was meant to be the fucking forty second episode of Remp or whatever. Yep, yep. But instead, it's the first episode of OGP. Tell I your mates. I still remember the days when we would be listening to uh, "Talk to My Ass," waiting so long for him to say "Talk to My Ass," and you know, around that time of just like looking to the gal, we found Code of Honor and was like, "We gotta do this." And you know, four years later, it's happened here. And, yep. you know, like, uh, four years adds a lot of uh, right back matches to the equation, but we got <laughs> there. And uh, now we have our we have our mission to go towards that of uh, uh, putting put on the gravity and just, like, talking about it. And then uh, put, yeah. put, put, putting uh, music of the year along with it. <laughs> 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 and... We have uh, another loose end to tie uh, with our prior journey. We're going to be looking at Cage of Death, aren't we, Eva? Yeah, Cage of Death 2002. It was the, it was the show I was most disappointed that when I sort of petered out of the whole rep routine that I never got around to. Because mm -hmm. Ring of Honor, I, I've seen Ring of Honor Final Battle before, the first one, and it's not it's nothing special. There's no, like... There's no like sense that like this is where every, all the loose ends get tied up and all that, and then earwams. You know, obviously, the the footage that you can get of the earwams is quite spaced apart, so and they don't really do storylines anyway, not huge ones anyway. But Cage of Death, that was what Lobo versus Zandig, the whole fucking story from January. <laughs> right up to the end of the year 
was was leading towards and I think it's our duty to watch it. It's our yes. duty to watch it and chant CZ fucking dub. Yes, yes. We need to see Zandig truly come back into power and I expect it to be putting on old clothes, very comfortable, you know, because yeah. I think uh, all three which we covered back in Rent Days uh, had identities, but no, none were more colourful than CCW, I feel like. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be great to get back there. And then from there, uh, we are no longer bound by this time period thing. We're just going to nope. be fucking... Uh, the shackles are off. Shackles are off. And we can just go into the motherfucking TARDIS and go anywhere we want. And, you know, fucking... We might watch the grapple from 1483. <laughs> Absolutely, and you'll be damn sure I'm going to find whatever the fuck was the hit song back then and put it in this podcast. Yeah. Uh, we might watch some grapple that took place in your backyard. <laughs> we might watch some grapple that takes place in, in space. <laughs> we might watch grapple that takes place in a molehill between two moles. <laughs> Everybody gonna die.